Okay, so let's start. Hare Krishna, so let's start off by offering a beautiful flower at the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada. Om Jnanati Mirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashatya Deshatarine Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamsya Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tamsa Jeevam Sadvaita Savadutam, Parijana Saitan, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Sri Radha, Krishna Padan, Sagana Lalita, Sri Vishakhan Vitamsha, He Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandho Jagatpate, Gopesha, Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta, Namostute, Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi, Radhe Vrindavaneshwari, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyasya, Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha, Patitanam Pavanebhyo, Vaishnavebhyo, Namo Namaha, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhara, Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Sarva Shastra Di Pusha Sarva Vaideka Satvala Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadhya Sarva Lokeka Drikvada Sarva Bhagata Prana Srimad Bhagato Prabhu Kali Danto Ditya Shri Krishna Parivartita Parmananda Pathaya Prema Varsha Aksharaya Te Sarvada Sarva Sevaya Shri Krishnaya Namostute Mad Ekabandu Mad Sangin Mad Guru Mad Mahadana Mad Nistaraka Mad Bhagya Mad Ananda Namostute Asadu Sadu Tadain Ati Nichota Takara Hana Muncha Kadachin Mam Prem Premna Rit Kantayos Puraha Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Naraya Namaskrityam Naranchayva Narottamam, Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudire, Nashta Prayashu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya, Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki, Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jaya Srila Prabhupada Ki Okay, so thank you all so much for joining. <clears throat> so uh, today we are going to discuss chapter 16 of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Chapter is titled, How Parikshit Received the Age of Kali. Okay. So before we start, any quick realizations from uh, chapter 15? What are the main points in chapter 15 that really is like key points that stood out to you? So, few devotees, if you like to turn on your cameras. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Uh, I missed last week, but I watched the web lecture. Uh, but the most important thing that was uh, coming to my mind was uh, how Mother Prabhu said, uh, when you chant, uh, you should chant as though this is your last day. That was very striking. And, you know, I, I started it with today and it was a, there was a big difference in how my chanting was. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. That's amazing. Yeah. Every month as our last month. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next. Um, I really like the 50 words from the way it's the devotee has to take his own flight. Yes, yes. Yeah, you know. So everybody else will help you, but you are the one who is to sub, you know. That's it's very, true. very practical, you know, very day to day life. Point. That finally we yes. all have to fly our own plane. So even at the time of death, you know, oh. we are so fortunate. Oh. Even at the time of death, we are so fortunate that we have devotees chanting around us. But if we have not prepared our consciousness to be absorbed in Krishna, 
in spite of devotees chanting around us, we may not be able to focus our mind completely on Krishna. We may still be attached to so many material things and think about this, think about that, and all those things. The exclusive devotion, we all have to prepare. We have to fly our own plane. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ratanadi. So um, when Arjuna was feeling, um, he was remembering Krishna's mercy and he was feeling so much separation. And um, and then um, when he thought about the Bhagavad Gita, the instructions of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, and that gave him so much solace. And um, the point that whenever we're in anxiety or any, um, you know, um, distress, we could always just remember the instructions of Bhagavad Gita and get solace in all conditions at any time. Uh, very practical point, right? You can always be have a shelter. When one has problems, distress, anxiety, turn, turn to the Shastras, turn to the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, Shiram Bhagavatam. And uh, in that section, we read like how when Arjun uh, was absorbed in this instructions of Krishna, then all the trash in the mind is washed away. Second, material contaminations are washed away. And third, the intelligence is uh, steadified. Right, and then uh, one actually gradually realizes his uh, original position. Thank you. Okay, any else? Any other points? I just want to add what you just said, and all the doubts will be gone, and um, we will be free from the three modes of material nature if we uh, keep Krishna's instructions in our mind. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for adding those two points. Okay. Anyone else? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, the main focus for this uh, chapter is timely retirement, like, you know, how and plan for our retirement and what we wanted to do, uh, uh, how we can serve. Um, the planning is uh, the key, you know, that we like it very much. Very nice point, Prabhu. So we enter the house of the life already thinking of an exit plan. <laughs> So we, we, when we enter the household, we are already planning of the next day. And uh, I, I'm not sure whether I mentioned this. Like, So in household life, we actually cultivate internal detachment, but externally we may still show the attachment. But as we progress towards Vanaprastha, then that internal detachment should also be accompanied with external detachment. Thank you. Yes, Mati. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Point, um, oh, one yeah. So uh, I was thinking about how, you know, Arjuna had all the powers to defeat even the demigods and once Krishna left the planet, it all vanished. It went, as long as we have Krishna with us and when he empowers us, we could have all these skills and talents, but when he decides they can go in a moment's notice yeah. no, no, not even a notice we we'll never be proud of the powers which we are borrowing from Krishna Krishna is giving us any moment we can take it and uh, it's true even in our devotional activities you know, we may be like good at like maybe leading kirtan or doing at some certain services but at any moment Krishna can take it away we see that with the entire Govardhan Lila as soon as they are still proud Krishna will just pull the card and then <laughs> like and bring us back to the ground. So, very nice point. Thank you. And also, like, you know, that also, you know, when we are knowing that Krishna has empowered us, then everything that we do, we should feel grateful. Oh, thank you, Krishna. You have given us. I'm just using this in my service. Hi, Krishna Prabhuji, then with Prana. So I really like the point that um, we need to have whenever we are chanting we need to chant like uh, it it helps us to move take our subtle body to the next body so we need to make sure that we absorb in the chanting and we need to do nicely yeah, yeah. thank you we are trying to spiritualize our subtle body okay so should we start <clears throat> so one so the last Last verse in the previous chapter, uh, chapter 15, is a false shruti where it actually says that, you know, anyone who with devotion, with Shraddha, yes, Shraddha, yet Bhagavad Priyana, who actually hears about the departure of the sons of Pandu, is actually fully auspicious, is perfectly pure, and anyone who hears this with devotional faith, he actually gains 
uh, devotional service unto Lord Shri Krishna. So, uh, so that is actually when Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, he says, Janma Karma Charme Divyam. He says, anyone who knows about my uh, birth and activities, he will not have to take birth again in this material world. That is actually even applicable to a pure devotee. You know, and here we see how the Fal Shruti is actually telling us, even for the pure devotees, if you are actually thinking about absorbing their Janma, Karma, and so on, even if you don't have to take birth in this material world. That's actually one uh, um, pastime by Prabhupada, uh, a disciple of Prabhupada, actually after the class or after room conversation, asked Prabhupada, and Prabhupada in the class was talking about how we should think about Krishna in the time of uh, death, then we'll go back to Krishna. And then he asked, what if I think about you, Prabhupada? And Prabhupada said, you'll get the same benefit. <laughs> you know? so, you, so meditating upon the pure devotees, their pastimes are actually non-different than the Krishna. Okay, so that's the Palshruti. Now in chapter 16, uh, so if you see the flow of the first canto, uh, Sonakadi Rishis, they have asked about Parikshit Maharaj. If you go all the way, they asked in chapter number four. Right? So chapter number four, they asked about Parikshit Maharaj, but they also asked about uh, how did Vyasa get inspiration to compile the Shrana Bhagavatam, and then that entire conversation between Narada, Vyasa, that took place. right? And then um, and then after that, like, he had to come. So after uh, you know the seventh chapter, the first few verses where Vyasa got his realization, then immediately to bring to the point of Parikshit Maharaj, then Sutta Goswami starts narrating of how Ashwatthama, like he releases Brahmastra and then that entire pastime. And then uh, then there was the other Brahmastra to Uttara, and then Uttara is coming to Krishna and asking, Oh Krishna, please save me. And uh, when Kun Queen Kunti is seeing that how Krishna is again and again protecting them. Then she composes all these beautiful prayers of Queen Kunti. And then at the end of the chapter, we see that Maharaj Yudhishthira is still, you know, in, in anxiety. He is still distressed. And, oh, so many people killed because of me. You know, I, just so that I become the emperor, so many people are, have been killed. And in spite of Vyasadeva speaking, Krishna speaking, he's not satisfied. And Krishna says, let's go to Bhishma Dev. And then that way he glorifies Bhishma Dev, Bhishma Dev. Instruction in chapter number nine. And then after that, after Krishna stayed for a few more months, then he said, okay, now time to go to Dwarka. Then we read about how the queens of uh, Hastinapur, they offered prayers to, to uh, Krishna and then Krishna entering Dwarka, one chapter just on how Krishna entered Dwarka. And then we came to chapter number 12. And chapter number 12, again, Shonakadi Rishi says, okay, let's come back to Parishit Maharaj. All this is so wonderful, so nectarian. Let's come back to Parishit Maharaj. And again, they asked about Parishit Maharaj. And then uh, chapter 12, they ask about Parikshit Maharaj. And then he, he starts off by saying that how Maharaj Yudhishthira, at the time of birth of Parikshit Maharaj, he called all these astrologers who predicted the glories of Parikshit Maharaj. So in chapter 12, we read, and today we'll actually continue kind of from that point about all these glories. And anyway, that reference will be there in this chapter. So all the astrologers, they predict these glories. And then since Maharaj Yudhishthira is there, we still have to come to the point of the Pandavas retiring. And before that, Dhritarashtra has to leave. So then the entire chapter of Vidura coming, telling Dhritarashtra, okay, time to wrap up, you know. All the signs are there, you're still here, you know, time to wrap up, right? So then we read about Dhritarashtra's leaving. And then uh, the previous chapter was how the Pandavas retired, right? And then we also read how Krishna departed and then Pandavas retired. So that came to a point. Now we are coming. So now everything, all the scene is set for coming directly to Parikshit Maharaj. So Sutta Goswami, when he's being questioned about Parikshit Maharaj, he's saying, yes, I'm coming to that point. But all this is so nectarian. So I want to share, share this. And Sonatadi Rishis, they are eager to finally come to the point of hearing the conversation between Sukadev Goswami and uh, Parikshit Maharaj. So they are eager in that way. But they are also relishing all these wonderful nectarian uh, katha. Right? So this chapter, we first start reading about how Parikshit, he becomes a king, how he rules, uh, he performs three horse sacrifices, and then he actually wants, um, uh, uh, once he actually sees that, oh, actually, um, <clears throat> sorry, I got this one. So once he actually sees that how the Kali in the form of a, a king, in the form of a Shudra, is actually beating the leg of a cow and a bull, right? And then it's described that he's, uh, Sutta Goswami is saying, and then he punished them. When Sonakadi Rishis are all here, he just punished them. He did not kill them. Such a grievous offense, such a serious 
offense and he did not kill them he just punished them and then they 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 compose few verses uh, glorifying you know asking this question that why did he just only punish and not kill kali you know someone hurting a cow and a bull that is such a serious offense he should have killed right away why did he not kill and please narrate and then he glorifies uh, you know again uh, topics which are related to krishna so few verses text 5 to 9 is that sona sona kadi rishi is uh, you know asking this question and then the story continues where it is described how parikshit maharaj how he saw kali was actually entering and then how he came to the point of seeing the uh, beating of the cow and the bull and then uh, there is a conversation between uh, mother earth in the form of a cow and dharma in the form of a bull Right? And that's how this chapter goes. Right? So there are five sections in this chapter. So let's get started. We start with text number one. Okay. So uh, I'm thinking like okay. Uh, so Ratna Raja, you want to? So should I read the Sanskrit? Yeah. Suta uvacha tatta parikshe dvijavarya shikshaya mahim maha bhagavata shashashaha yatahi sutyam abhijata kovida samadishan vipra mahat gunastata. Okay, so who's on the list? Uh, we have Vijay Radhika Mataji, then Vijay Mataji, then Sri Radhika Mataji. Hare Krishna. Uh, translation uh, Suta Goswami said, O learned Brahmanas, Maharaja Parikshit then began, began to rule over the world as a great devotee of the Lord. Under the instructions of the best of the twice-born Brahmanas, he ruled by those great qualities which were foretold by expert astrologers at the time of his birth. Hare Krishna. Right. So in chapter 12, we read about how Maharaj Yudhishthir had asked all the astrologers, please tell us about Parikshit Maharaj. And, yes, uh, he had, and all those Brahmanas had predicted that how he would be... Uh, in maintaining all those who are born, he will be as good as Ishwaku in following Brahmanical principles. He will be as good as Lord Ramchandra. And among bowmen, he will be like Arjun. All those qualities were there in chapter 12, right? So now it is described that how Parikshin Maharaj. And it says, Tataha, right? So it starts with Tataha. Tataha means that after. That after referring to what? After Pandavas have retired. Now Parikshin Maharaj started to rule. And how did he rule? He ruled by all those qualities which were actually foretold by those astrologers, right? So it says, Mahadguna, uh, Abhijata Kovida. So all those uh, uh, ex Abhijata Kovida is the expert astrologers who actually predicted all these qualities. So he ruled with all those qualities. And another important word is Mahabhagavata. Mahabhagavata means a great devotee. So whenever we read our Parikshit Maharaj, this word is actually even previously used that Parikshit Maharaj is referred to as Mahabhagavata. His, his main qualification is that of he being a great devotee. Right? And then Mahat Gunaha, all those great qualities. So Prabhupada in the purport focuses on this point that the reason Parikshit Maharaj had all that Mahat Gunaha, right? all those great qualities which are predicted by the Brahmanas, is because he was a Mahabhagavata. Right? So this theme come, uh, is uh, repeatedly said. Actually, there's this, uh, in Prahlad Maharaj's prayers to Lord Narasimha Dev in the fifth canto of Bhagavatam, there's a verse where it says, Yasyasi Bhakti Bhagavati Akinchana, Sarve Gunes Tatva Samasa Tensura, Harav Abhaktasya Kuton Mahaguna, Manorathena Nasate Dhavato Bahi. That basically says, the verse says that those who are devotees of the Supreme Personality of God, Sarver Gunes Tatra Samasatin Sura. They are blessed with all the good qualities. On the other hand, those who are not devotees, how can we say they have good qualities because they are always on the mental platform? So they may show some good quality, but because they are on the mental platform, you know, when there is a challenging situation, they may actually not show that quality. So their quality is also up and down, but the devotees of the Lord they are blessed with all the good qualities. Right? Even in uh, Chaitan Charitamrita, when uh, Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami is describing the 26 qualities of a Vaishnava, right? in that, there is one quality which actually says, Krishnaika Sharanam. And he actually makes a point that this quality of taking shelter of Krishna is actually the king of all the qualities. And 
all the other qualities are like servants who actually accompany this one quality, just like servants accompany a king. Yeah, servants follow a king. Right? So Prabhupada talks about that in the purport that because he was a great devotee of the Lord, then uh, he had all these good qualities. Another point to think about is that how our heart is actually it belongs to Krishna, right? We are, uh, you know, our spirit soul, we are part and parcel of Krishna. Our heart belongs to Krishna. But right now, our heart is plundered by different enemies. So just consider a kingdom where the king, instead of the king ruling, the, some plunderers have come and taken off the king. And the, all the plunderers are ru ruling, right? So who are the plunderers? Lust, anger, greed, envy, pride, illusion. These six people. So they have come in, they have taken. So in our heart, these six have taken, you know, are now ruling our heart. Right? So how can we get rid of all these bad qualities? Just by invoking Krishna Bhakti. So as soon as Krishna Bhakti enters into the core of the heart, all these six, uh, you know, uh, plunderers go away and the natural pure qualities of the spirit soul actually happen. Right? So hence that point is so important that once we cultivate, once we are a devotee of the Lord, then he has all the good qualities, even that of the gods. Okay, so that's the first point Prabhupada talks about in the purpose. The second point is when we say Mahabhagavata, a first class devotee, right? Prabhupada says there are two things. One is that he himself is well versed in the science of devotion, right? He himself should know the science of devotion. And then the second point is he can convert others to become devotees. So the qualities of a Mahabhagavata is he himself is actually a wonderful devotee. He knows the Shastras. He himself is exemplary in his, uh, you know, in his devotional service. And the second quality is that he can convert others to become devotees. So uh, actually Prabhupada often quotes Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Bhakti, where Bhaktivinoda Thakur is actually making the point that we can actually say, uh, uh, we can identify a Vaishnava in proportion to the number of devotees he has created, right? It's it said that the position of a Vaishnava can be tested by seeing how good of a touchstone he is. And that is by seeing how many Vaishnavas he has made during his life. And that is the Mahabhagata. Right? So Mahabhagata is not only one who is personally, you know, exemplary in his devotion, but also one who actually can make other devotees into now, other people into devotees. So even uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he speaks to Haridas Thakur and he says, you are the best of devotees. Why? Because you have achar and prachar. Right? You yourself are exemplary in your devotion service, chanting 172 rounds every day. Plus, you yourself are like a touchstone where you make others into devotees. Okay. So second point. The third point that Prabhupada stresses in the purport, he says how Maharaj Parikshit Imagine all the qualities that were described in uh, chapter 12, right? As glorious as Lord Ramchandra, as glorious as Arjun, as glorious as Shibi, as glorious as this. But still, in spite of all the qualities, it is said that he used to take instructions from the uh, Dvija uh, Vipra, right? Um, from the Dvija Varya Shikshaya, right? So he took instructions from the Dvija Varya. Dvija Varya are the twice-born Brahmana. So, <clears throat> so in, one may think that, you know, Maharaj Parikshit is so qualified. All these qualities, does he still need to take instructions from someone else? Mm -hmm. So Prabhupada is actually focusing on that point. That this is the quality of a devotee and a quality of a true king, that he is always under the guidance, he is always taking guidance and instruction from the Brahmana. And Prabhupada actually talks about this combination of Kshatriya and Brahmana. So the Kshatriyas rule always under the guidance of the Brahmana. Right? So these two, when there is a qualified Kshatriya and when there is qualified Brahmanas to actually give instructions to the Kshatriyas, those two together can actually form a perfect combination. Like even in further in Bhagavatam in the third canto, when we have been reading about um, uh, Swayambhu Manu and Kardamuni, right? And Swayambhu Manu, he is the emperor of the world. And Kardamuni actually is just a, a Brahmana, a sage. But when they meet, they actually glorify each other. And they actually point out how each one is actually 
protecting the other. The brahmanas protect the kshatriya by uh, giving them knowledge, you know, giving them instruction so that they don't do anything. And the kshatriyas actually protect the brahmanas by actually providing from them and also protect them by physical strength. Right? So this way the brahmanas and kshatriyas both work together. And that's why the word uh, shastra is there. Right? Prabhupada actually mentions this point in the in his purpose. Shastra. So if you say there is Shastra and there's Shastra. Right? Shastra means weapon, right? And Shastra means knowledge. Right? Prabhupada says both of them come from the root word to protect. The Brahmanas are protecting and the Shatriyas are protecting. One is protecting with knowledge and the other is protecting with uh, giving physical strength and also by maintaining. Right? So these are three points Prabhupada focuses on the purport. And he says, because uh, Parikshit Maharaj was an ideal king, in spite of all his qualifications, he was always under the uh, taking instructions from those who are actually twice born. Okay, text number two. Number two. Sa utara satanayam upayema iravatin. Jan me jayadim shaturas tasyam utpadayat sutan. King Parikshit married the daughter of King Uttara and begot four sons, headed by Maharaj Janamajaya. Janamajaya. So this is actually here four sons, and the eldest of them is Janamajaya. So Prabhupada in the purport talks about the uh, life of Janamajaya. And uh, before that, he actually makes a point that how Parikshit is actually marrying the daughter of King Uttara, who is actually... Uh, the daughter of his own maternal uncle, you know, like, like you say in Hindi, you say mama. It's like marrying his mama's daughter, you know. So Prabhupada actually says that in in Vedic uh, system, cousin brothers and sisters are allowed to get married if they do not belong to the same gotra or family. Prabhupada talks about that, and then he comes to the life of Janmeja. How, uh, you know, there were four sons, and he was the eldest of the four. And then after this, actually comes in the twelfth canto. Uh, chapter 6, I think. So, where it's actually described that when Maharaj Parikshit was killed by Takshaka, then Janmejaya, actually his son, got so angry that he actually took a vow to kill all the snakes, including Takshaka. So, he actually did a yagya, right, Prabhupada called Sarpa Yagya, to kill all the snakes. So, he was doing that yagya and all the snakes by the Brahmanas chanting of mantras were actually attracted and they were going into the yagya. And then he was thinking that why is Takshaka not coming? So he asked the Brahmana, why is Takshaka not coming? And the Brahmana said, he's not coming because he's protected by Indra. You know, if you uh, remember the forest, uh, uh, the, uh, the burning, the forest fire, that episode, that also the same past name, how Taksha is, Takshaka is protected by Indra. And I won't go to that. But they say that Taksha is protected by Indra. Then uh, Janmeja said, okay, then invoke the mantra to even burn Indra. <laughs> he was like, so. And actually the Brahmana, they chanted the mantra. And then Indra, it is described, he fell off his throne and Indra and Takshaka were actually coming into the fire. And at that time, uh, uh, I forget who, but one personality comes and says, no. I think Kashyap, Kashyap Muni. Yeah, yeah, I think probably it's Kashyap Muni. Yeah, I think you're right. So he comes and he says, no, no, you stop this. You know, just for one Takshaka, you are trying to destroy the entire snake dynasty. You know, that is not required. And then they stop, they stop the Yagya at that point. And then uh, Janmeja actually at the, uh, yeah. So he says uh, how Mahamuni Vyasdev was also there in that ceremony. And then he actually asked Vyasdev, you know, he hears, uh, he asked Vyasdev about his uh, father Parikshit and how he has been missing his father. And at that time, uh, actually Parikshit, by uh, uh, Vyasdev's power, Parikshit actually comes there. Though he's, you know, one way he's passed away, but he actually comes and then Janmeja comes and he worships uh, his father Parikshit. So that is described. So Prabhupada describes that whole, whole thing about uh, Janmeja. Okay, text number three. Ajaha Rashva Medam Strin Gangayam Bhuri Dakshinan Shara Devatam Gurum Gritva Deva Yatrak Shikocharaha Hare Krishna Translation 
Maharaj Parikshit, after having selected Krupacharya for guidance as his spiritual master, performed three horse sacrifices on the banks of the Ganges. These were executed with sufficient reward for the attendants. And at these sacrifices, even the common man could see demigods. Hmm. So it is, you know, we are reading about uh, Parikshit Maharaj, how he's, you know, ruling so nicely, how he got married, he had four children, so all about Parikshit's rule. And here is saying how he actually performed three Horse sacrifices. He says, three Ashwamedhan. Three Ashwamedhan means horse sacrifice. So he performed three horse sacrifices and he did that under the guidance of Kripacharya. Right? So, uh, Prabhupada, anyway, I'll come to that point. And then uh, these were executed with sufficient rewards for all the attendants. Right? We read previously how um, Parishit Maharaj was very charitable. Right, one of the qualities that the uh, astrologers have said about his charity. So he gave sufficient rewards. And at this sacrifice, even common men could see demigods. So Prabhupada in the first word talks about this, that how even demigods, they can actually uh, come to the earth. It is, he says the interplanetary system, the travel is actually easy. easy. But, um, and then previously when the kings were so pious, we did like throughout Bhagavatam or King Prithu and all these persons. And when they do sacrifice, then the demigods, they actually come you know, to be a part of this sacrifice. You know? And also Prabhupada makes a point that these demigods, just like one cannot just directly see Krishna, you know. So similarly, one can see the demigods only by the grace of the demigods. So demigods come and they say, oh, the king, Parikshit is so glorious that we will actually give darshan to all the citizens of the kingdom. So the, the demigods have to select to actually give their darshan. Right? So the demigods used to come and uh, due to the influence of Parikshit Maharaj, they are demigods, they actually agree to be visible. And so that's one point Prabhupada talks about. The second he talks about how um, Maharaj Parikshit, he actually gave charity just like a cloud distributes rain. Right? And this is actually explained that how does the cloud actually form? It's taking water from uh, the different water sources. So similarly, the king, he actually collects taxes from the different people. But then when the clouds are formed, again, the water is showered back, right? Similarly, the king, when he actually has the taxes, he actually lavishly, how the cloud actually pours water, like, you know, even on ocean, everywhere, on stones, everywhere. Similarly, the king lavishly gives the money that's accumulated in taxes as charity. So Prabhupada talks about that. And the third point the Prabhupada says that how Maharaj Parikshit, even for a king like Maharaj Parikshit, there was need for a spiritual master for guidance. Without such guidance, one cannot make progress in spiritual life. And um, I've been, I mean, someone thinking about this point, and I actually heard this point in Prabhupada's lecture that how, even though we may actually, you know, uh, let's say, become very learned in Shastras, know lots of verses, do so much service. But in front of the spiritual master, what is our mood? Prabhupada says this in the lecture. I actually uh, got this. It is better if you remain a fool always before your spiritual master. It is better if you remain a fool always before your spiritual master. Then you will advance. If you think yourself, even for a moment, I know something more than my spiritual master, your fellow. So in front of our guru, in spite of, you know, uh, you know, uh, knowing so much shlokas or whatever is our, quality, or maybe being very rich or whatever is our qualities, in front of the guru, we are like a fool. Guru Maharaj, you know, we are here. You know everything. I know nothing. Please instruct me. That's all. So it's not that we act like a fool. But our mood is, we are in that mood of, uh, uh, we remain a foolish person. Like we are not, you know, proud of anything because anything we have is actually mercy of Guru. You know? So having that mood that, yes, we need that guidance. Without the guidance of spiritual master, we cannot actually make progress. Okay. So text number four. Nija graho drasa vira kalim dik vijaye kwachit nripalinga dharam shudram gnatam go mitunam pada. So, the next, yeah, go ahead. Talk about the truth. 
So we have Sarovit Prabhu and Ratnamadika. I don't think Pratnamadika. Yeah. Text four, right? Yeah, text four. Once when Maharaja Parikshit was on his way to conquer the world, he saw the master of Kali Yuga, who was, the, who was uh, lower than a Shudra, disguised as a king and hurting the legs of a cow and bull. The king at once caught hold of him to deal with sufficient punishment. Mm. So he's saying, <clears throat> so now it is describing that how he was ruling. And then it says, <clears throat> once when Maharaj Parikshit was on his way to conquer the world. So he says, Digvijay. Right. You may have heard this word, Digvijay, right? The one who, when he was actually traveling to conquer the world. <clears throat> and Prabhupada points out that Parikshit Maharaj, when he was traveling the world, it was not for like self aggrandizement, that, like, oh, I am so great. I am so. No, he is actually traveling around to make sure that everything is actually going according to the principles of Dharma. Right? That is the duty of a king. So he was traveling everywhere to make sure. That everything is going right. If something is not right, then he is actually correcting and so on, right? Not for self ego. Oh, I am the conqueror. I am the emperor. Not in that way. So, Prabhupada points that. Okay. And then, um, and then what did he see? He saw Kalim. He saw Kalim, uh, uh, the master of Kalyu, who is lower than a Shudra, right? lower than a Shudra, uh, disguised as king. So, it says, Nripa Linga Dharam, right? Nripalinga Dhara means one who is dressed like a king. Right? And what was he doing? Natnam. He was hurting. Go Mithuna. Go means cow. Mithuna means bull. Right? Go Mithuna and Pada. He was actually hurting the legs of a cow and a bull. So uh, Prabhupada points out the first thing he said is like, you know, how Maharaj Prashri was traveling just to make sure that everything is going in order. And it is uh, because the king is a representative of the, uh, uh, of the Lord, he has to make sure that the Dharma is still established in his kingdom. And, uh, and then Prabhupada actually, he talks about um, how a king cannot tolerate insults to the most important animal in the purple, Prabhupada says. Which is the most important animal? The cow. Mm -hmm. So Prabhupada says, a king cannot tolerate uh, insults to the most important animal, the cow. Nor can he tolerate this disrespect for the most important man. Who is that? The Brahman. Most important animal, the cow. Most important man, the Brahman. And Prabhupada is saying, a king cannot tolerate insults to both of these categories. And if you see throughout, like particularly in first canto, we see how Prabhupada stressed so much on the two main aspects of Vedic culture. What is that? Cow protection and Brahminists. Yeah, cow protection and Brahminical culture, right? These two things culture. Prabhupada stresses again and again. So here also he's making the point that this cow protection and Brahminical culture. And what is the relationship between this, right? So Prabhupada says, there is a miracle in milk. Cow gives milk, a miracle in milk. For it contains all the necessary vitamins to sustain human physiological conditions for higher achievements. So Prabhupada is actually pointing out how milk is such a miracle food. It has actually everything required to sustain human physiological conditions. And then Prabhupada says, for Brahmanas means to develop the mo mode of goodness. And for developing the mode of goodness, that is the necessity of food which is actually prepared from milk. How much stress again and again Prabhupada is actually giving on how milk is actually a miracle food. Actually, another purple Prabhupada makes the point that by having milk, it actually nourishes the finer tissues of the brain so that we can actually understand spiritual knowledge. So, so much importance to milk, right? So, so uh, Prabhupada talks about that and then uh, uh, importance of Brahminical culture and cow protection. You know, for uh, when we hear these two points, Cow protection and Brahminical culture, you know, these are so important. And Prabhupada in one purport, he says that without these two aspects, cow protection and Brahminical culture, there is no human civilization. Human civilization starts off when these two points are kept in mind. Right? So from our side, what can we do to actually establish this? Well, there are so like, you know, ISKCON has many like cow protection projects where you can adopt a cow or give some 
financial help for towards this cow protection project. Cow protection is so important. Again and again, we are reading it down. So give something, you know, you can do a monthly thing, you can adopt the cow, help these, you know, Goshala projects. That is one thing. And the second thing about Brahminical culture is to actually, one, is distribute Prabhupada's books, spread the knowledge. And second thing is we ourselves study it and we actually speak this knowledge to the world. Right? So these two things, we have our responsibility. If each one actually takes, you know, part in these two things, somehow support protection of cows, you know, how it is so unfortunate that how many cows are being slaughtered every day. At least we can do our part of supporting these cow protection projects. And the second one is to actually uh, act and develop the qualities of Brahmana, learn, right? That's Pathan Pathan. We have to study and have to teach the knowledge, what does distribute the purpose books. Okay. Uh, Right. And then Prabhupada talks about how Kali means mismanagement and quarrel. And the first symptom of Kali is these two. When How do you know if the king is actually working under the influence of Kali? The first thing they do is they actually hurt the cow and they actually destroy the Brahmical culture. These two are the signs of kings who are actually under the influence of Kali. Okay, okay. next. Let's go to text number five. Text five. Shonaka Uvacha, Kasya Hetur, Nijagraha, Kalim Dig Vijay, Nirpaha, Nridheva, Chinadrik Shudra, Koso Gamya Padahanat, Takatyatam Mahabhaga, Yadi Krishna Katashrayam. Shonaka Rishi inquired, Why did Maharaj Parikshit simply punish him since he was the lowest of the Shudras, having dressed as a king and having struck a cow with his leg? Please describe all these incidents if they relate to the topics of Lord Krishna. Hmm. So, so they are asking Kasya Hetu, for what reason, right? Kasya Hetu, for what reason did Parikshit only punish them? Because in the previous word, we actually read that it, it particularly the word used there is Nijagraha. Nijagraha means he sufficiently punished. And now these sages cannot accept that point. If someone is hurting the cow, which is the most important animal, which is supposed to be worshipped by everyone, how would why would Parikshit Maharaj only uh, just punish him? Why not? Why did he not kill him? Right. So Kasya Hetu, what is the reason? Right. So that way, Shonakadi Rishi are uh, po uh, pointing out, and Prabhupada in the purport <clears throat> actually makes a point that such a severe offense. One is, okay, so two main points Prabhupada says. What is the offense here? One is certainly I mentioned that the cow is being hurt. The most important animal which is worshipable is actually being hurt. And the second thing is a king, a shudra is actually dressed as a king. Right? A shudra is dressed as a king. So the king is actually supposed to be a representative of the Lord. But here a shudra, a low class man is dressed as a king. You know, and he's going to take responsibility. So both the administrator class and then second is the cow. So such a severe offense. So Rishis could not imagine that why, you know, like the culture at that time was, why would someone only punish? Why not kill? Such a severe offense. They should have, he should have killed right away. Right? So they asked, Kasya Hetu, for what reason did you only punish and not kill? And then he actually says, Yedi Krishna Kathashray. I want to know the reason, but please narrate this only if it is topics related to Krishna. And you see again and again this point. And we see that, you know, even in Maitre Rishi and uh, Vidura, same thing. <clears throat> Vidura, I'll ask the question and say, please narrate only if it is related to Krishna. And uh, Prabhupada in the purport points out that how... Uh, Anything dovetail with Krishna is worth hearing. Otherwise, it is not. Right? So whether it's politics, whether it is, uh, you know, Prabhupada in uh, one of the classes I heard, he was saying that, you know, there are so many battles that took place throughout history. You know? But why are we so interested in battle of Kurukshetra? We could have uh, selected any other battle and uh, like focus on it. No, only battles. Why? Because the Bhagavad Gita was spoken, Krishna is right there. It's right there, right? So anything that's related to Krishna is worth hearing. Otherwise, it is 
useless, right? And Prabhupada says in the purport, Krishna is the purifying ingredient in all matters. Whatever is happening, as soon as we bring Krishna into the picture, he is the purifying ingredient. Like how the example is given. If someone is as contaminated, you know, Prabhupada gives an example of urine, right? But as soon as the sun rays fall upon it, immediately it purifies it. Right? Similarly, however polluted the world atmosphere is, as soon as we bring Krishna into the picture, then everything is purified. And how can we bring Krishna? It's actually a mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That it's not that, you know, oh, this is contaminated, we have to establish a deity. Wherever we are, whatever place we are, we can just remember Krishna. We can chant the holy names of Krishna. You know, even if you know, we, <clears throat> like many of us, we ask this question that we are out in the world and then, you know, we have to deal with all these people who, you know, are not devotees and how do we do it? How are contaminated? We always have the power that, okay, they are talking all prajalpa here, this, that, and we are in the situation where we cannot just run away. We have to be there in our mind. We can still chant. We can bring Krishna. And as soon as Krishna is there, everything is purified. Right? So Prabhupada says Krishna is a purifying agent in all matters. So only if topics are dovetailed with Krishna, they are worth hearing. Otherwise, they are not hearing. Now Prabhupada also <clears throat> makes a point in the lecture that without Krishna, everything is zero. Everything is zero. Right? You know, your house, property, all those things, they are just zero, zero, zero. But Krishna has the power. As soon as you bring Krishna in the center, the one zero becomes ten, two zeros becomes hundred, three zeros becomes one thousand. Right? So Krishna is that one, you know, who can actually make everything uh, pure. Okay, take six. A beautiful verse, this verse is actually, uh, uh, yeah, this is actually one of the verses to memorize. Six. The devotees of the Lord are accustomed uh, to licking up the honey available from the lotus feet of the Lord. What is the use of topics? which simply waste one's valuable life. <clears throat> so, Athava, otherwise, so they said, speak about topics which are related to Krishna. And then now they are saying, otherwise, topics which are not related to Krishna, what is the use? Kim Anya, what is the use of anything else? Why? Because anything not related to Krishna is, first, Asat, illusory. Right? Second, Alapehi, uh, sorry, Ayushaha. Ayushaha means it just reduces the duration of life. Third, Asatvyaha is unnecessary waste of life. Anything that's not related to Krishna is illusory. It is reduces our duration of life. It is unnecessary waste of life. Right? And then, the, so that those are lines three and four. And then coming back, and then it says, uh, and then it says, Asya Padam Hoja. Makaran, mak, makaranda liha. So of those, so the devotees, they actually lick the honey from the lotus flower of, right, of the lotus feet of Krishna. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the devotees of the Lord are accustomed to licking up the honey available from the lotus feet of the Lord. What is the use of topics that actually is illusory, reduces duration of life, and is unnecessary based of time? So, uh, yeah, so this is a verse that Prabhupada and Prabhupada talks about how uh, Lord Krishna and his devotees uh, are both on the transcendental plane. And again, he talks about the same point that if there are topics which are actually dovetail with the Lord or his devotees, then they are worth hearing. Otherwise, you know, mundane topics are just useless waste of time. Okay. Now, in the second paragraph, I'm going to just read the starting of the purport. Our duration of life is not very long, and there is no certainty of when we shall be ordered to leave everything for the next stage. Such a powerful sentence. Huh? We can just meditate on this sentence. Our duration of life is not very long. There is no certainty of when we shall be ordered to leave. We don't have a choice. It will just come like an order, and we just have to leave everything. Right? 
Thus, it is our duty, hence it is our duty to see that not a moment of our time is wasted in topics which are not related to Krishna. It's our duty to see that not a moment of our time is wasted in topics not related to Krishna. Any topic, however pleasant, is not worth hearing if it is devoid of this relation to Krishna. Right? <clears throat> Actually, if you see, we'll come to chapter 19 of the first canto, <clears throat> when Maharaj Parikshit, after being cursed, you know, he goes to the assembly, and then <clears throat> Sukhdev Goswami actually comes into the assembly, and Maharaj Parikshit actually asks this question, right? Please tell me, what is the duty of everyone in all circumstances, specifically those who are going to die? Right? So this is the 19th chapter we come, and Maharaj Parikshit asking this to Sukhdev Goswami. Tell me the duty of everyone in all circumstances, particularly those who are going to die. Right? And then we see that how Sukadev Goswami, he starts off the uh, second canto with verses, which are actually very similar to the verse that we read, we read today. <clears throat> yeah. So he says... Uh, uh, So he says, uh, Shrota, uh, let's see, okay, text 3 of uh, this is 2.1.3. Nidrahaya riyate naktam, yayayena chavavaya, diva chari hara rajan, kutumba barani nama. So Prabhupada quotes this often, right? So the verses there, he actually starts off. So Kri Goswami is initially starting off and making the point that those people who are materially engrossed, they are blind to the ultimate truth. They have so many subject matters to discuss, right? The lifetime of suffer householder is passed at night by sleeping or in sex indulgence and in daytime either by making money or maintaining for family members. Right? Persons devoid of this spiritual knowledge do not inquire into the real problems of life. Being too attached to the fallible soldiers like the body, children, etc. Right? Although sufficiently in, uh, experienced, they still do not see the inevitable destruction. So, here we see Sukhdev Goswami. He's starting off the narration by pointing out you know, the same point which is actually mentioned this. And then he actually makes this point. Tasmad Bharata Sarvatma Bhagwan Ishwaro Hari Shotavya Kirti Tavyasa Smartavya Chateshta right? It says Tasmad Bharata Sarvatma. Therefore, O Parikshit Maharaj, right? O descendant of King Bharata, one who desires to be free from all miseries should do what? Must shrotavya, must hear about, must glorify, and must remember the supreme personality of God. The one who really wants to be free from all miseries must hear, must uh, glorify, and must remember the supreme personality. So we see how Sukhdev Goswami is starting off answering Parikshit Maharaj's question. With the point, Parishim Maharaj question is, what is the duty of everyone in all circumstances, specifically who is going to die? And this is what Sukhdev Goswami is saying. Right? And this verse is pointing out the same thing. Right? So any topic, however pleasant, it is not, um, worth, is not worth hearing if it is devoid of relationship. Okay. And then Prabhupada also points out, um, <laughs> I'll give a point on this also, how are Goswamis were so expert like Jiva Goswami, right? So when you learn Sanskrit, the first part in learning Sanskrit is learning the grammar, Vyakran, right? And Jiva Goswami is so expert that when he had to write the book of Vyakran, Sanskrit grammar, he actually wrote the Harina Vyakrana. And in that, he actually used all the grammar he's explaining in, name, in terms of names of Krishna. So I don't know how many of you have learned like Sanskrit. I remember I had to learn Sanskrit in my school days. And in that also, when we learned Sanskrit grammar, it was Rama, Ramo, Ramaha. Like all the Sandhis was all based on names of Krishna. And Jiva Goswami is so expert. All the rules in grammar, Sanskrit grammar, he actually connected them with names of Krishna. Otherwise, you know, mundane Sanskrit grammar, Mm -hmm. Maybe like, oh yeah, how is it related to Krishna? You want to use it later on for studying Shastra. But at that time, that entire grammar, he actually made it that while studying, you're chanting the names of Krishna. 
Sir, Goswamis are showing that how even though we have to deal with so many topics, we can always, you know, somehow or other connect the topic to Krishna. Then the topic is worth hearing. Otherwise, it is. And then in our life also practically like uh, like recently in you know one uh, you know the summary where discussing Bhagavatam, you know, you see you're walking, you're going anywhere, you see a pond, and immediately you say, Oh, Radha Kun or Sham Kun, or you know, this is Yamuna, right? We think in that way, right? Anything we see, we actually connect it to Krishna. And Prabhupada is so expert at this, you know, like he's walking down the beach. And he sees a sunrise or a sunset, and immediately he says, Oh, he connects us to some philosophy, or he says, Oh, this sunrise is actually uh, the eyes of Krishna. He says, Oh, so beautiful sunrise. So imagine how the creator would be so much more beautiful. So, everything, whatever we are doing, we just kind of somehow or other use our intelligence to connect it to Krishna. Okay, and then the last point in Swap Purple Prabhupada actually says that how why is uh, Krishna's feet called like you know like lotus feet right so we have discussed this in terms of uh, Queen Kunti who can say that verse quickly Namo Pankaja Nabaya Namo Pankaja Nodine Namo Pankaja Nitraya Namaste Pankaja like everything Krishna is just like a lotus right and we discuss in that section that you know in this material world everything is like you know you know, nothing in this material world can compare to the beauty of Krishna. Right? But still, for us to understand, oh, how beautiful is Krishna, the most beautiful object is said to be a lotus flower. Right? So hence, Krishna is actually described Krishna's lotus feet. Right? Other explanation that Prabhupada gives, one is, you know, to compare to the most beautiful object. The other explanation Prabhupada gives is that the space, uh, the shape of the spiritual world is actually like a lotus flower. And then when Krishna actually descends, Goloka Vrindavan actually manifests here. Right? So the Bhauma Vrindavan is actually non-different from Goloka Vrindavan. So a lotus is actually manifested here. And because Krishna is, you know, in his dham, so hence Prabhupada says, uh, the spiritual planet Goloka Vrindavan is shaped like a world of a lotus flower. So when the Lord descends, then the dham also comes. Thus his feet remain always on the same lotus flower. And hence his feet are also as beautiful as the lotus flower. That's what Krishna is said to have. Lotus feet. So uh, uh, maybe I will, I will share this image on the group where you, know, you can see. Like there's a, if you want to read more about this, it's a very uh, detailed subject matter about Brahma Samhita. If you see the first few verses, it actually describes how the spiritual world Goloka Vrindavan is in the shape of the lotus flower. Okay. Um, I have some photos, but um, okay. I will I will share it maybe in the break time. If you, I'll actually share some photos. You can quickly do it, then I'll show you right now. So those are two points. Okay. So anyway, let's continue. And uh, if it comes up, then I will show you that. So uh, text number seven, right? So basically here, uh, they have actually made the point that devotees, they are just used to lick the honey from the lotus feet of the Lord, right? Um, and uh, what is the use of any other topics? Okay, next uh, text seven. Shudra Yusham Namanga Martyanam Rita Michatam Eho Pahuta Bhagavan Ritu Shamitra Karmani. There are those amongst men who desire freedom from death and get eternal life. They escape the slaughtering process by calling the controller of death a maraja. Hare Krishna. Mm. So now one may say that, yes, you know, this is a, a, this a nectar of uh, you know, devotees are used, satam, the word is used, devotees are uh, used to lick the nectar of the lotus feet of Krishna by hearing topics related to Krishna. But one may say that our life is still limited. 
So all the sages may say that, oh, that is so much amrita, but we are not eternal to relish this nectar, this amrita. Right? To even relish that nectar, we have to be eternal. So this verse is actually saying, Shudra, uh, so it says, Shudra Ayusha, so very small duration of life. Nina, living being. So we human beings have a very small duration of life. Like Martina, we are sure to meet that. Right? So, but we have a desire. Ichatam Ritam, we have a desire to become eternal so that we can actually relish the nectar of Harikata. But how can we do that? Because Yamaraj is there and he's going to take us. Well, the only solution is Let's invite Yamaraj into the assembly. So if Yamaraj is here in this assembly and he's hearing the Harikatha, because Yamaraj is also a devotee, so if he's hearing the Harikatha, then even we will actually will have a long span, lifespan to actually relish this Harikatha. So they're saying there are those amongst men who desire freedom from death and get eternal life. They escape the slaughtering process by calling the control of that Yamaraj. So our Shonakadi Rishi are actually is making the point that we have invited Yamaraj into this assembly right now. So you continue showering this nectar of Amrita of topics related to Krishna. And because Yamaraj is here and he is relishing the topics, we all don't have to worry about that. And we will we can relish this topic. Right? So Prabhupada points about uh, makes that point in the purport. Our only hope of suspending the cruel slaughtering process of Yamaraj is to call him to hear and chant the holy name of the Lord. Yamaraj is a great devotee of the Lord and he likes to be invited to Kirtan. So even Yamaraj is looking for the invitation. The next time we have a Kirtan program, we can also send an email, yamaraj at gmail.com. Please come to our email, uh, to our program. We have nice Harikatha and Kirtan. Join us and then we can actually register. the nectar of Harikatha. Yeah. So Prabhupada says, the great sages, they invited Yamaraj to attend the sacrifice performed on Naim Shalini. So text number 8. So before we go to 8, I'll just uh, share my screen. Please. Just to quickly show you this. Um... Prabhuji, you can send email right now so he can join. <laughs> yes. You never know, we are actually discussing Harikatha and Yamaraj may be listening to <laughs> So this is actually a description. This is very complicated, but the Brahma Samhita actually describes how the spiritual world is actually in the shape of a lotus. So um, you see the Goloka Vrindavan planet here and all the petals are the eight uh, principal gopis of Krishna. And then after that, we see the uh, uh, the eight principal manjaris, Rupa Manjari, Rati Manjari, Lavang Manjari, and so on. Right? So eight principal uh, manjari. And then, uh, so this is a spiritual world. And then you see at the border, there's Mathura, there's Jagannath Puri, there's Dwarka. Right? And then if you expand out further, uh, you know, anyway, there are different charts, but it's said that all these four, these uh, four corners here, are actually the Vaikuntha planets. So you have Pradyumna, Anirudh, Vasudev, and Sankarshi. Right? And this is a very complicated subject, but just to show that it is actually in the form of a lotus. And the other nice point to see is that when Krishna's pastimes are taking place, then uh, sometimes we hear about how Radharani, she has to walk all the way from uh, Varshana to uh, maybe Gokul or Vrindavan, right? Let's say she has to walk all the way. And if you see, as such, the distance is large, but one of the lotus petals will actually just close. And then the distance will become very short. And then immediately Radharani can come here. And then based on the past time, the lotus petal will open and then the distance will be cut. Right? So in that way, it is actually in the form of a lotus. Okay, text number eight. Nakashti tavad yavarasta hi hantakaha etanartam hi bhagavan ahuta paramarshi bihi aho nriloke pieta hari lilamritam vachaha Translation, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. As long as Yamraja, who causes everyone's death, is present here, no one shall meet with death. The great sages have invited the controller of death, Yamraja, who is the representative of the Lord. Living beings 
who are under his grip should take advantage by hearing the deathless nectar in the form of this narration of the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. Na kashin miriyate. No one is going to die here. Tavat, as long as, and Tavat is so long, Yavat, as long as, as long as who? Yamraj is actually present here in this assembly. Here is his Bhagwan word is used to refer to Yamraj. He is present in this assembly and no one is going to die. We have invited him here. And uh, so, and basically he's making the point, living beings who are under the grip should take advantage by hearing this Amrita. Hari Leela Amritam Vachaha. So actually under the grip uh, should take advantage by hearing this deathless nectar in the form of narration of the pastimes of the Lord. So Prabhupada says, the surest ready remedy for avoiding death is to accustom oneself to hearing the nectarian pastimes of the Lord. That's the other verse in the Bhagavatam. It comes in the second canto, third chapter. Ayur Harati Vai Pumshan. Right, which actually says, both by the rising and the setting of the sun, it is actually taking away the life of everyone, except for those who are actually hearing Harikatha. Because when we are hearing Harikatha, what are we doing? We are actually engaged in our eternal occupation of uh, relishing Krishna Katha, or serving Krishna in that way. So as long as we are in that mood, you know, our ages, you know, we don't need to worry because we are engaged in our eternal occupations of the spirit soul. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that's it. So, let's go further. Okay. Uh, you know, one nice verse I can quote here uh, about the Amrit of uh, um, yes. So, uh, in 10 Canto, 31st chapter, I'm sure everyone knows this word. So gopis are actually saying this. Tava katha amritam. Again, that word amrita. Your the nectar of your uh, the the words of your pastimes, your katha is actually amrita. And tapta jivanam, it actually gives life. For all those who are actually suffering in this material world. So we will eat it. So great thinkers, they have described this uh, pastimes of your uh, of your uh, pastimes of, of you. Kalma sapaham, it actually dries away all our sinful reactions. And shravanam mangalam, giving spiritual benefit to everyone. It causes mangalam, auspiciousness to anyone who actually hears this message. And one who actually broadcasts this message all over the world, that person is the most magnificent. Shravana Mangal Srimad Atana, Bhuvi Grinati, who actually trans, uh, broadcasts this message all over the world, that person is the most magnificent. My Guru Maharaj used to say, yeah, here is a reference of Srila Prabhupada, who is actually, uh, trans, you know, who has actually taken the message of uh, Krishna, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all over the world. He is the most magnanimous of all personalities. Okay, let's go back. Text number nine. Mandasya manda pragyasya vayo mandayushas chavai nidraya hriyate naktam diva chavyarta karma bihi. Lazy human beings with paltry intelligence and a short duration of life Pass the night sleeping and the day performing activities that are for naught. This is very similar to the verse that in uh, uh, Canto 2, text 1, and, you know, almost the lines also are sim similar, where uh, Sukhdev Goswami is speaking, and he actually, the that verse says, Nidra Hayate Riyate Nakta. So line 3 is actually similar to 2.1.3. Vyavayena Chavareha Deva Cha Arthaya Rajan Right. So again, that Diva Cha Vyartha Karma Bhuvi, similar, right? Kutumba Bharanima. So the point is saying, Mandasya Manda Pragya. So lazy people, right? Uh, and small intelligence, small age, right? Short age, right? All those are qualities of uh, you know, Manda Sumanda Matayo. We read the other words also, right? So, <clears throat> so lazy human beings with uh, small intelligence, short duration of life, what do they do? They actually are passing their night sleeping 
and they performing activities that are simply not not means vyartha vyartha means useless right useless so this is basically um, all the shonaka adi rishis are making the point that there is so much nectar of krishna katha and you can even invite yamaraj and become deathless by licking this honey available from the lotus feet of the lord but unfortunately there are these human uh, lazy humans with no intelligent and short duration and they are simply wasting their life hence you continue speaking this hari katha and by this when we get a taste we can actually give this message and even those unfortunate human beings can actually start to relish this hari katha right? so in that way they are actually encouraging suta goswami by bringing out his mood of compassion to all living entities and say please continue it is a urgent situation there are all these people who are lazy who are actually just simply wasting their time please continue speaking hari katha that is the only solution for all these people so in that way uh, this is the last verse that uh, sonaka dirishi has spoken uh, is spoken to uh, suta goswami and then from next verse suta goswami starts speaking so in the purport proper points are that uh, the intelligent they take care of this important gift by strenuously endeavoring to get out of the entanglement so you know so this human form of life is actually a special gift and those who are intelligent they realize how special this gift is and then they take care of this important gift you know just like you know if someone gives you a gift you know, and then you don't give value to it and the person next time says i gave you such a precious stone and he is not even you know, giving any importance the next time you'll say i won't give him a precious gift and that's the same with mother nature say so, okay i gave him this human form of life but he's actually not using it for the right purpose but those who are intelligent they realize how important is human form of life and they strenuously endeavor to get out of the entanglement to use this human form of body to actually go back home back to the earth there's actually a verse in the 11th canto of bhagavatam which actually says this human body which is uh, obtained by the laws of nature it is a very rare achievement this human body can be compared to a perfectly constructed boat right the human body is a perfectly constructed boat and the spiritual master is the captain the knowledge of the vedas are the favorable winds right in <clears throat> favorable winds and one who actually does not use this boat of human form of life to actually cross over this ocean of material suffering he is just known as the atmaha or the killer of the self this is a beautiful verse it comes 11 20 17 okay no problem uh, okay so let's continue now suta goswami will continue the past tense so, so the question is why did Uh, Parikshit Maharaj only punish and not kill Kali, and the answer will be given now from these verses. So text ten. Suta Uvacha Yada Parikshit Guru Jangale Vasat Kalim Pravishtam Nija Chakra Vartite Nisham Yavarta Manati Priyam Tata Shara Sanam Samyuga Shon Dirada De. Who's next? I think Gopinath the Chaipu is not here, so it doesn't really want to help. Mati, will you be able to read? Divin Tele Mati. This text 10. <coughs> so the Goswami said, While Maharaj Parishit was residing in the capital of the Kuru Empire, the symptoms of the age of Kali began to infiltrate within the jurisdictions of his state. When he learned about this, he did not think the matter very palatable. He did, however, give him a chance to fight. He took up his bow and arrows and prepared himself for military activities. Hmm. So when Maharaj Parishit was residing in the capital, he saw Kalim Pravishtam. Pravishtam means enter that Kali has actually entered into his kingdom, and then what is it? Ani an aniki priyam vartam. He found this news not very palatable. Said, "Oh, Kali has entered 
said, oh, this is very bad. But at the same time, he was encouraged. Okay, now this gives me a chance to fight. And that's the mood of a Kshatriya. Kshatriyas, they get very happy when there's an opportunity for them to fight. So when Kali entered, the Maharaj Parishri was like, yes, and now is an opportunity for me to fight Kali. Right? This award gave him a chance to fight, so he took off his bow and arrow and he got ready to fight Kali. Right? So Prabhupada points, what are the four, uh, what are the symptoms of the age of Kali? Four things. Intoxication, meat-eating, gambling, illicit sex. Right? These are four regulative principles and Prabhupada says these four things, activities, are actually the symptoms of Kali Yuga. And as soon as Maharaj Parikshit heard that these symptoms were entering, immediately he got ready to fight. And Prabhupada says, just like if someone is expert at playing a sport, you know, or if someone is good at cricket, immediately there's an invitation. Oh, there's a cricket match. And then, you know, how you will get so eager, like, oh, cricket match, I want to go and play. Or whatever is your game, favorite game, and so on. So similarly for Maharaj Parikshit, when he heard, opportunity to fight, he got very excited. And then Prabhupada also makes that point that, you know, why uh, Kali, anyway, like we read previously, that how Maharaj Parikshit, when he was cursed, he did not as such invoke the mercy of Krishna to actually undo the curse, right? And we read two reasons. That one is basically that he did not, uh, you know, think about disturbing the Lord. He did not want to ask undue favor. And second, he knew that anyway, it is a period of Kali Yuga progressing. So anyway, that Kali has to come. That is a sequence of events. So he did not want to. But here, one may ask, why is Kali, now Maharaj Parikshit want to go and fight with Kali? Mm -hmm. And then Prabhupada actually makes the point that even though it is now the age of Kali Yuga, which is actually uh, going to come, Maharaj Parikshit is seeing that now is the age of Kali Yuga, but being a devotee, being a, such a powerful king, he wants to make sure as long as possible to actually fight those symptoms of Kali Yuga. Right. And Prabhupada says, it is just like out of laziness or unfortunate men will give some arguments that, oh, anyway, Kali is going to come. Why should I worry? You know, let people do all their nonsense. I'll just focus on my spiritual life. Prabhupada says that is basically lazy and unfortunate people. Those who really, you know, are devotees who know how to fight Kali, they would actually make use of this opportunity and say like, people are suffering under the influence of Kali. Let me do my best to actually give people Krishna consciousness. That's the only solution. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is so merciful. Let me spread the mercy. That is the mood. That is the right mood. Mm -hmm. So when there is like, you know, so much we hear about Kali and all these influence of Kali going on and so much shooting and violence and, you know, all sorts of nonsense. One way we should be like, oh, this should inspire us to actually be more uh, aggressive in our preaching. And say like, no, no, Kali is actually gaining hold. Let's go ahead. Let's go distribute books. Let's do some preaching. Let's go out, do Harinam, Sankirtan. That's the only way, you know, that we should be inspired by hearing all the nonsense to actually increase spreading the holy name and spreading Shri Prabhupada's book. Okay. So, uh, right. okay, so next, uh, Prabhupada also makes the point that, you know, there may be a prediction that there's a rain or an ice storm going to come. Right. That doesn't mean that you say, okay, rain, ice storm, I won't do anything. No, you get prepared for it. You take an umbrella, you wear your jacket. So similarly, Kali is going to come, but you get prepared to fight Kali. Okay. Next level. So, yeah. okay. maybe this one we'll just do the uh, English. Yes, yes. So this sounds good so long. Translation. Uh, Maharaja Parikshit sat on a chariot drawn by black horses. His flag was marked with the sign of a lion. Being so decorated and surrounded with charities, cavalry, elephants, and infantry soldiers, he left the capital to conquer in all directions. Right. So this is how Maharaj Parikshit, he saw Kali entering. How did he actually start to fight? And he's actually preparing himself. He sat on a chariot drawn by black horses. So what was... Uh, his uh, grandfather Arjun's horse colors, white. White horses. White horses. Here it was black horses. What was uh, the flag of Arjuna marked with? <laughs> Anuman. Anuman. And here it is actually marked with the sign of a lion. Right? And then he was decorated. He was uh, surrounded by charioteers, cavalry, elephants, infantry soldiers. So here, you know, practical point for us. 
when you are fighting with Kali, we are all prepared, right? Like how Maharaj Parikshit got all prepared. And how do we prepare? What are our weapons? How do you get prepared to fight Kali? Harina. Okay, Harina and what? Books. Books. Hearing Bhagavatam. And what? Crucial point. Hey, why is why is Maharaj Parikshit getting all these charioteers, cavalry, elephants? Why is he preparing him himself in that way? Because we need the power of devotee association. Yes. Alone, if we go and fight Kali, we may not be strong enough and we may be washed by the influence of Kali. So hence we go with a team of devotees all together and we say, now we are together. And now okay, we have empowered to fight Kali. So always we should be in the association of devotees. Okay, text 12. Badrashram ke tumalam cha bharatam chotaran kurun kem purushadineva varshani vijitya jagre balim. Hare Krishna, Maharaj Parikshit then conquered all parts of the earthly planet. Bhadra Varsha, Kutumala, Bharata, Northern Kuru, Kimpursha, etc. and exacted tributes from their respective rulers. Hmm. So, <clears throat> see, all these places, Prabhupada and Purport gives a description of these places. Mm -hmm. And uh, one way I hesitate to go more into details of this because in the fifth canto, we are going to cover this in more detail. <clears throat> but right now, what I'm going to do is uh, let me see if I can quickly share my screen. Uh, one minute. I'm not able to find my own notes. Uh, just uh, okay. Okay. So, so maybe in this meantime, while find my notes, maybe people, uh, you all can just do a quick uh, overview of what we studied. Any point that stood out to you, or uh, anything about the flow of the chapter so far? Please just uh, please share any points. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I like so many points. The main point that I like is that the, the there are so many qualities of Maharaj Parikshit, but his main quality is that he is a great devotee of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I also like the point that how we should never waste a single moment of our life. Um, any topic that is not worth hearing, that is um, the, any topic which is not related to Krishna is not worth hearing at all. Yes. Very nice. Thank you, Mati. And when we hear Hari Katha, we are engaged in our eternal occupation. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Hare Krishna. Yes. So, uh, adding to what Vijay uh, Mataji said, our duration of life is not long, so our duty is not to waste uh, in topics that is not related to Krishna. And always hear, glorify, and remember Lord Krishna. Everything we do, somehow or other, we try to connect that to Krishna. Okay, so now I'm ready to share my screen. <clears throat> okay, so here in this verse, it is described how Maharaj Parishit then conquered all parts of the earthly planet. Badrasa, Ketu Mala, Bharata, then Northern Puru, Kim Purusha, etc. And exactly treat tributes from the respective rulers. So here, if you see in the description, one may say Badraswa, it is a tract of land near Meru Parvat. It extends from Ganmadan Parvat to the saltwater ocean. What is this? Right? What is this? So this is all described in the fifth canto. So I will share these images on the chat also. So when you see the images and you read the text, it will all make sense. So let's see first it talks of Badraswa, right? So if you say Badraswa, Right? It says, it is a tract of land near Mount Meru. So you can see Badraswa verse here. 
Can you see my pointer? Yes, okay. So this is Badraswa, and this is Mount Meru. And this entire thing is actually Jambu Dweep, right? We're also surrounded by salt water ocean. So Badraswa Varsh is here. And it extends from Ganda Madhana Parvat to the salt ocean. So this Parvat is actually the Ganda Madhana Parvat to the salt ocean. Right? And similarly, I've just given you one example. But then there's Ketu Mala Varsha, right? That is right here. You see Ketu Mala Varsha, right? So that's the next one Prabhupada talks about. And then he talks about Bharata Varsha. That is right here. You see Bharata Varsha from the mountains. These are Himalayan mountains to the saltwater ocean. And then uh, <clears throat> in the center is Ilavarta Varsha. Then uh, northern portion of Jambudip is known as Uttara Kuru Varsha. So that is right here on the top. You see Kuru Varsha, right? See Kuru Varsha. So I will share this Kim Purusha Varsha. It's all here, right? It's all here. So basically, it is described and how Maharaj Parikshit he conquered all these different, you know, parts of the Jambu Deep. Prabhu, is, is Jambu Deep the Earth planet? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. That uh, Prabhupada actually many times when he explained Jambu Deep, uh, he referred to that as the Earth. You know, but one way also <clears throat> sometimes Earth is actually just considered as Bharat Varsha from the Himalayas to the saltwater ocean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we try to relate the explanation of Sriman Bhagavatam to our current understanding of like how we say solar system, that the Earth, that is this planet, you know, it may not match one to one. Mm -hmm. It may not match one to one. So, we go with the explanation of Bhagavatam where it says, okay, this is Jambu Dweep. And then, you know, where is Jambu Dweep? <clears throat> so this Mount Meru, this is Jambu Dweep right here. And this is showing how the Ganges actually flows. See? See how the Ganges comes, it divides into four, and then it comes to the Earth planet through the Himalayas. Right? And uh, anyway, we come to the fifth canto. All this will be nicely explained. So this is Jambu Dweep here, Mount Suvero. <clears throat> Another view of the same thing, right? Salt water ocean. And then, if you see, so this is Jambu Dweep, Right, salt water ocean. Then there is next is Plaksha Deep, and then there is the ocean of uh, sugarcane juice. Right, then there is some other deep. There's ocean of liquor ocean. Right, so in that way, there's like these like you know, uh, different islands. <clears throat> okay, so I won't go much into this. And uh, if you have any questions on this, then uh, please uh, put it in the chat because I won't discuss right now. This is a very complicated topic, and if can do goes. But you know, just because Prabhupada explains that, oh, this is from this mountain to this, you can just look at the image and it will be clear for you. Okay, text 13 to 15. Let's just go to the English translations. Who's next? Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, wherever the king uh, uh, visited, he continuously heard the glories of his great forefathers, uh, who were all devotees of the Lord and also of the glorious acts of Lord Krishna. He also heard uh, how he himself had been protected by the Lord from the powerful heat of the weapon of the Aswadhamma. People also mentioned the great affection between the descendants of and uh, uh, Prutha due to the latest great devotion to um, Lord Kesava. Uh, the king being uh, very pleased uh, in the singers of such glories opened his eyes in great satisfaction. Out of uh, magnanimity, he was pleased to, uh, to award them very valuable necklaces and uh, clothing. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Baba. So, so now it is described that when Maharaj Parikshit was traveling and conquering all these different places, what was the hearing? Right? When you go to different places, what do you hear? Normally you hear about just <laughs> so many materialistic topics, that'll be the sports, this politics, and all those things. But what was Maharaj Parikshit hearing? Four different things. One is Swapuruvesham Mahatmanam. He was hearing about the great devotees, his own father that he was hearing the glory of all the Pandavas. Right? Second one, he was doing Yashaha Krishna. He was hearing the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. Third point, Atmana Paritratam Ashwatthama. That he was hearing how he himself was actually protected by 
the Brahmastra of Aswatthama by Krishna. Right? So he was hearing over that protection. And then fourth one, Sneha Vrishni Parthana. That he was actually hearing how there's so much affection between the Vrishnis and uh, and, uh, between the Vrishni, descendants of Vrishni and those of Pritha, right? the Pandavas. So how much between the Pandavas and the uh, Vrishnis, how much there's so much affection between them. So these are the four points that he was hearing everywhere, right? And after hearing these points, what was his uh, what was his reaction? Okay. Uh, he became very pleased, like particularly the words are used, Parama Santushtaha. When he was hearing all this, he became Parama Santushtaha. He became extremely pleased. And it says, Preeti, uh, his eyes pleasingly opened his eyes with that. You know, he was so pleased that he was, you know, he described pretty uh, uh, attraction, right? Pleasingly opened his eyes. And then he is described out of magnanimity, he was actually giving uh, necklaces. And, you know, he, right? So Prabhupada in the purport, he first of all talks about how when, when he was hearing about the Pandavas, you know, when you hear about the pure devotees, and when, you, when he was hearing that how he was protected by the king, that is actually the glory of Krishna. When we hear about pure devotees, that is non-different from hearing about the glories of Krishna because the pure devotees, uh, everything, their entire life is about Krishna. Their entire life is reciprocation with Krishna. And by hearing about those devotees, you hear glory of Krishna. And then one of the points is Yashaha Krishna. When you hear the glories of Krishna, that will actually you hear glories of his devotees. So Prabhupada and the purpose stresses on this point that how we cannot separate the glories of Krishna with the glories of pure devotees. Right? The, like when we talk of Srila Prabhupada, you know, we talk about how many challenges he went through and the glories of Srila Prabhupada. And all that is actually we say, oh, Krishna has empowered him in such a nice way that he is actually preaching the glories all over the world. And we talk of the glories of Krishna, we talk of glories of his pure devotees. How can you talk of Krishna without talking of the glory of Srimati Radharani, the gopis, and so on? Right? <clears throat> so Prabhupada talks about that now. The next point that he says that this the material world, okay, he elaborates this point further and he says how this material world is full of danger at every step, right? But the devotees of the Lord are actually protected from all these dangers by the mercy of the Lord. So you know, that's the point that, you know, again, when you talk of devotees, pure devotees, you talk about Krishna. Oh, how these devotees are protected by Krishna. And that's basically, you see Krishna's hand in the life of the pure devotee. Right? <clears throat> um, okay. and, then, and then the other point that uh, Prabhupada says is, you know, wherever the king was going, there was something known as a welcome address. You know, wherever some great personality goes, immediately everyone assembles and like, oh, the Prime Minister has come. They'll go and they'll glorify. Oh, Prime Minister, you are so-and-so. President, you are so-and-so. But Prabhupada points out that right now the welcome addresses, they are only flattering lies. <laughs> They're only flattering lies. Like people just come and say, oh, you are the best president ever. You know, there's no one as great as you. But that is just a flatter. You know, just a flatter. And then that person also sings like, oh, yes, that is who I am. Now this person has recognized my true glory, right? But Prabhupada says, now this is just some flattering lies. But previously, this was how the welcome address was. When the welcome address was, it was spoken on glories of Krishna, the glories of the person in relationship to Krishna. Everything in relationship to Krishna. So Prabhupada compares that. Okay, text 16. I will do a Sanskrit for this. Saratya parashata sevana sakya dotya virasana nugamana stavana pranaman shnigde shupandu shu jagat pranatim cha vishnur bhaktim karoti nripatish charanara vinde. Translation. Maharaj Parikshit heard that out of his causeless mercy, Lord Krishna, Vishnu, who is universally obeyed, rendered all kinds of service to the malleable sons of Pandu by accepting posts ranging from chariot driver to president to messenger, friend, night watchman, etc. 
according to the will of the Pandavas, obeying them like a servant and offering obeisances like the one younger in years. When he heard this, Maharaja Parikshit became overwhelmed with devotion to the lotus feet of the Lord. Such a beautiful verse, right? So it actually says, it says, uh, uh, so it says Sar Saratya. Saratya means Krishna accepted the post of a chariot driver. Parshada. He accepted the acceptance of presidency in the assembly of Radhasuya. Sevana, uh, Sakya. You know, think of Lord as a friend. Dautya, he accepted the post of a messenger. Vira Asana, he actually, uh, uh, acceptance of a post of a watchman, right? With drawn sword. And he actually did all these. Anugama, he followed the Pandavas. Right. And then it says Jagat Pranitim. Jagat Pranitim means that Lord, who is the supreme personality of Godhead, who is to be uh, how does Prabhupada explain this? Obeyed. Uh, who is universally obeyed, right? Who can deny the authority of Lord Sri Krishna? Even we cannot, like even the atheists cannot deny the authority of Lord. They are forced to under. Uh, forced to go through the laws that are created by Krishna, the laws of karma or law of death and so on. Who can deny the authority of Krishna? So Krishna, who is universally obeyed by everyone, that Krishna, you know, who is the supreme personality of God, who is the original creator, Janmadhyasya Atta, uh, Anvayad, Itaras, Charteshu, Abhigya Swarat, that personality, what is he doing? He is becoming a watchman. He's becoming a chariot driver. He's becoming a servant. He's following the Pandavas. You know, this is our Lord. This is our Lord Shri Krishna. So wonderful. Like in spite, you know, even in this material world, like, you know, sometimes if like some big personality, let's say some president, you know, does some very humble task. You know, in India, like there was some something about the the Prime Minister of India, like, you know, he met his mother and how he was falling at her feet and offering obeisances and there was like a photo and such a big thing that, oh, see this Prime Minister, such a great person. You see how, how he's so humbly offering obeisances to his mother, right? So even in this world, someone who is so powerful and he does some humble act, like, you know, even in a Delhi temple, there was this, uh, this one Delhi once, there was this news about uh, one of these, you know, Prime Minister or big, you know, minister had come Right. And when he came, he came in simple, like kurt, uh, kurta, and, like very simple clothes and no bodyguards. He just said, I'm walking into the temple. So he just came in a very humble boat and became such a news article. And see this person, so powerful, but in front of Lord, he's coming so humble. Right. The point I'm saying that even in this world, someone who has power, who acts humbly is actually glorified. People see, oh, such a great person is acting so humble. But see our Krishna. He is actually the original Janmad Yase Yataha. He is the original source of everyone. Everyone in the universe follows him. And what is he doing? He is washing the feet of guests who has actually come for Rajasuya sacrifice. He is taking the position of a chariot driver. He is standing at a night watchman. Like in India, like watchman is considered like such a you know, low position. Like, oh, in the night he will be there. You know. and Krishna is taking the position of a watchman. Just for you know, because of his love. You know, the real glory of Krishna that we see is how he is conquered by the love of his devotees. And in that mood, he is actually willing to take anything to serve the devotees. And one verse here is actually uh, used is Snigneshu, unto them who are malleable to the will of the Lord. And why so much affection for the Pandavas? Because Signeshu, that word is there. Basically saying the Pandavas are malleable to the will of the Lord. That means they are willing to do anything, sacrifice anything for the service of Krishna. That is their exclusive devotion for Krishna. And because Pandavas are so exclusively devoted for Krishna, Krishna says, okay, for them I will do anything. I'll carry them, I'll act as your servant, messenger, whatever. They have actually purchased me by their love. Mm -hmm. So the more we are able to sacrifice ourselves, be malleable, that word is very nice, malleable to the will of the Lord. Right? The more we are malleable to the will of the Lord, the more Krishna will reciprocate in our lives. Right? Such a beautiful word. Right? And when Maharaj Parikshit heard 
about the interaction between the Pandavas and Lord Shri Krishna. What was his reaction? So he says, Vishnu Bhaktim Karoti Nripati Charanaravinda. Just by hearing his devotion, hearing this interaction between the Pandavas and Lord Shri Krishna, he became overwhelmed with devotion to the lotus feet of Krishna. How do we get bhakti? By actually hearing the interactions of the devotees with Lord Shri Krishna. So, uh, <clears throat> and there was this, and there's another point that I've been meditating upon, and this was actually in Govardhan, that, you know, finally, like, if you see our heart, there's a verse in the Bhagavatam, that while chanting the holy name of Krishna, if our heart, if you're not crying tears, then our heart is stone-hearted. How can we melt this stone-hearted heart? When we read about the devotion of our Acharyas to Lord Shri Krishna, particularly how they have expressed in their bhajans like Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his Shannagati or Narottam Das Thakur in his Pratna or Rupa Goswami in his so many other books that he has written. When we read about how they are opening their heart and expressing their love for Krishna, how they are surrendering to Krishna by reading, by meditating on these uh, moods of emotion by our Acharya to Lord Krishna, then the heart can actually melt. So, Parikshit Maharaj, he became overwhelmed with devotion by actually hearing these interactions between the Pandava and Lord Shri Krishna. And Prabhupada says, simply by appreciating the dealings of the Lord with his pure devotees, one cannot be in fact perfection. Simply by appreciating, oh, see how the Lord is actually reacting to us, how the Pandavas are serving us. Simply when we start appreciating this, then we will actually. Right? So in Bhagavatam, what we are doing by studying Bhagavatam, we are just studying the interactions between the pure devotees and Krishna and uh, what is that verse? One seven six. What is that verse starting? Who knows, who knows, who knows. Come on, you're only giving a shloka test. Which, which verse? Uh, 176. Yesam Vaishruya Mananam, Krishna Parama Purusha, Bhakti Utpade Pumsha, Shokam Mutam Pai. Like, uh, uh, Yesam Vaishruya Mananam, just by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, what happens? Uh, Bhakti is actually utpadade. It actually grows in our heart just by hearing the nectar of Sri Bhagavatam. And that's basically what's pointed out, Prabhupada is pointing. When we hear the dealings between pure devotion and Krishna, bhakti is arising in the Prabhupada. Okay, text 17, and then we'll stop and take a good break. Text 17. Tasyaiva Amvartamana Sya Puru Purve Sham Ritim Anvaham Nati Dure Kilasharyam Yad Asitani Bodame. Now you may hear uh, from me of what happened while Maharaja Parikshit was passing his days, uh, hearing of good occupations of his forefathers and being absorbed in the thought of them. Right. So now he's just saying, okay, now I'm going to continue the story. And Maharaj Parikshit, he was traveling all around and then he was hearing these pastimes and in that way he was becoming overwhelmed with devotion. Right? He was just absorbed in uh, the interaction between the devotees and Lord Shri Krishna, this fact of devotion. And now, Sudha Goswami saying, now I'll, I'll continue the story. So now we basically talk about how uh, Maharaj Parikshit will actually see this, uh, the cow and the bull and we come back to the point of we see the king dressed as a shudra, you know, beating a cow and bull, and how that conversation proceeds. Okay. Okay. Any uh, comments? Any questions? We'll take a quick break, and then, you know, <clears throat> or any realizations? Anyone wants to share any points? Um, Prabhuji, I really like the point that when we, when as you said that when we see that. Oh, Kali is advancing instead of being lazy. Oh, what can we do? This is Kali Yuga. We should be more aggressive in preaching and spreading the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Wonderful point. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Prabhuji, I have several questions, but um, I can ask later and let others share. Okay, anyone wants to share? Uh, Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Uh, in, in front of a guru, uh, we have to be a fool. Yeah, if we uh, even for a moment, if we think we are better than Guru, then we are finished. It's not that we act like a fool. Yeah, right. <laughs> we, uh, yes, right. So that point is important because Prabhupada, in one of the letters, he makes this point. It's not that we act like a fool, but you know, we understand we are a fool in front of the Guru. Very nice point, bro. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that. I'm hoping someone will bring that point because you know, it's, you know, when we, it's a very practical point to realize in front of the Guru. It's a fool. Thank you. Bro. And actually, this is, you know, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself has demonstrated this. In the conversation with Prakash and the Sanskriti, we read in Chaitanya Chaitanya. He says, uh, Guru more murka deki. He says, my spiritual master saw me as a fool. And Prabhupada, he comments. He says, this is Nimai Pandit, that greatest scholar who defeated Kish uh, Keshav Kashmiri, the best of all philosophers. But in front of his Guru, Guru More Murkade. My spiritual master saw me a fool. And hence he said, You don't study Vedanta, you just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> the proverb very nicely explained the point in his uh, lectures. But you know, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is showing the point of that being a fool in front of you. Thank you. Uh, Sri Ramati? I was uh, thinking about this point on text 9, Prabhu, how intelligent people need to take care of this important gift that we got as a human body to endeavor to get out of this entanglement. And also I like the word malleable, mm -hmm. how we need to mold ourselves to the will of the God. That's also good. Yeah. Malleable. We have to be malleable to the will of the God. Thank you. Thank you for the thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shambhu. Uh, I am just really stuck into the point for 16 minutes. I'd like simply by appreciating the Lord's activities with his devotees. You know? So you know, I saw that video of how in Christmas spirit of hills where the person was telling you know, you know, I would have been. I was just thinking that just face came and like his life is successful as well as Prabhupada has written in the book. So it's wow. Thank you. Thank you. So one thing is appreciating devotees. One point is appreciating the dealings of the devotees with Krishna. So both points are there. Thank you. Okay. So uh, should we take a quick break? Okay. So let's come back in five minutes. And uh, the rest of the chapter, you can go fast. You know, it's, uh, it's not so much to explain. I'll stop at maybe like two, three verses then, maybe a little bit. But remaining. Okay. So please come back in five minutes. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna.
Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare. Everybody chant and dance. Okay, Hare Krishna, everyone, please uh, come back and get started.
Hare Krishna Prabhuji, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, see, Prabhupada stresses the importance of milk, right? So yes. I was just wondering, like, uh, these days, when uh, is it okay to... Um, I mean, I was I heard about uh, Ahimsa milk and other things, right? So is it okay to consume the non-regular milk? Um, this, is a, this is a topic that has been discussed among devotee circles, it's like discussed so many times and and devotees have different views on this, you know, like some of them quote that when Prabhupada actually came to the West, you know, he actually used the milk, which is like store bought milk. So some quote on that, you know, it is like, you know, there's not like one opinion, different devotees have different opinions. Um, like, you know, personally, I feel like, you know, our first thing, try to get Ahimsa milk because by getting Ahimsa milk, though it is more expensive, you are actually supporting cow protection. And if you can get Ahimsa milk, then you offer it to Krishna, make nice sweets for Krishna. Krishna loves milk, milk products. So, so that's the best thing, right? Try to get Ahimsa milk, offer it to Krishna. Um, yeah, otherwise, store bought milk, like I think people have different opinions about milk. So, I, I'm not going to comment anything further because, like, people have different opinions. I have a personal opinion about you know, about it, but I'm going to share it here. But, but you know, we understand like the main point for devotees is to understand the importance of milk, not to just say, oh, you know, why milk? Like, you know, we, I, I do feel like sometimes devotee, um, as devotees, like we don't uh, appreciate what is real milk. You know? You go to Vrindavan, you get the milk, the milk product, the sweets from milk. You know, like every day morning they offer this sandesh to Krishna Balram. Then you know you relish that sandesh prasadam. It's like the best thing in the world. It's like is there anything more, you know, wonderful to offer to Krishna. So you should try to get the milk as, as much as possible. If you can get it, then offer it to Krishna. Like, but you know. If ahimsa milk is not available, that you know, like in our temple, like sometimes if ahimsa milk is not available, then we still get store-bought milk, but get a good milk. Like you know, you have some of the milk brands which are you know, which talk of like a cow is protected or you know, things like that. So I don't, I don't, uh, there's a lot of discussion on the subject, but um, cow protection is that point is undeniable. The fact that we have to somehow protect cows. Okay, okay. So let's continue. Um, so we are reading text 18 and now let's just do the English right for now if there's a Sanskrit word I will refer back to it but let's just go ahead with the English who is next on the chat hi, hi. text 18 the personality of religious principles dharma was wandering about in the form of a bull and he met the personality of earth in the form of a cow who appeared to grieve like a mother who had lost her child she had tears in her eyes and the beauty of her body was lost Thus, Dharma questioned the earth as follows. So now this next section from chapter, uh, from text 18 to 24 is basically Dharma's questions to uh, Dhara. Right? That is the cow, uh, the earth in the form of a cow. And um, so if you see Subodhini, there are actually 11 questions here. Right? So we'll discuss one by one. I'll list those 11 questions. And we see the situation in which like Dharma, the principle of religion, the form of bull, how he's seeing the cow, right? If you see the situation of the cow, the Sanskrit word is Ashru Vadanam. Ashru Vadanam means tears in her face. And how, how severe is those tears? Vivatsam. Vivatsam Eva Mataram. That basically means if a cow has lost her offspring, you know, for a mother to lose her child, that's like the most painful thing, right? So, the mother, the mother earth is crying in such a way as if a mother, as like a mother who has lost a child. So, so grievous is the situation. Of mother. You know, so, that's a important thing. And then again in this purport, Prabhupada talks about uh, milk. Milk is a miracle of aggregate food values. <laughs> again, you hear about importance of milk, right? And then Prabhupada also talks about the, how bull is the emblem of moral principle, cow is the representative of earth. And both these bull and cow needs to be protected. Bull will actually help in production of grains, and then cow will deliver milk. And then if you have bulls and cows, you have a piece of land, you can live happily, Prabhupada says. It. That's all you did. 
You don't need iPhone. You don't need this. You don't need that. Just one cow, one bull. You grow your own, own, uh, own grains and get nice milk. Offer nice sweets to Krishna. You can be happy. Like, you know, one way if you see, like our lives become so complicated. And you can see, oh, well, that is a model here, which is actually, you know, simple living, I think. Right? That's one of our principles. Okay, so let's proceed. Text 19. Hare Krishna. Oh, uh, one point, sorry. Before you read, I also want to mention that Chakravati Pad makes this point that it's not that, you know, this cow and bull was, like uh, uh, Chakravati Pad says, Parikshit actually meditated with a desire to see this scene of cow and bull. So it wasn't like he had actually that he was blessed with that divine eyes to see this conversation between cow and bull. Right? So that's that's one point. So yeah, the Prabhupada says it's not visible to ordinary people, but Parikshit was blessed with that mystic eyes to see this internal uh, conversation. Okay, next uh, Go ahead. Dharma in the form of a bull asked, "Madam, are you not?" Uh, are you not hale and uh, hearty? Why are you covered with the shadow of grief? It appears by your face that you have become black. Are you suffering from some internal disease? Or are you thinking of some relative who is always in a distant place? So actually all the symptoms that we are going to read, like all the questions that Dharma is going to ask uh, the bull, is basically the symptoms of Kaliuga. Right? So Prabhupada in the purports, he again and again says, oh, this is a symptom of Kali. So what are the points in this text 19? First is, are you not, not hale and hearty? Your health is not good. Right? And Prabhupada point, in Kaliuga, everyone has so many health diseases. Right? And as Kaliuga is progressing, you'll see the list of uh, diseases increasing more and more, particularly in relationship to the mind. Like the World Health Organization says the number one form of disease is those related to mind, anxiety, stress, and so on. So, so are you not hale and hearty? Is your health not good? Then you're covered with a shadow of grief. Right? So Prabhupada says the faces of the people of this age, oh, by the faces of the people, one can find find out the index of the mind. By looking at the face, one can see. The index of the mind, right? How is the mind, right? And you see, actually, like you, know, you see people in Kalu, like you know, normally the face is like sad, dull, like you know, there's no like you know how we see people in devotees like effulgent, bright, smiling. But in general, you know, people in Kalu are so it's covered with a shadow of grief. So Prabhupada says that you know their face is an index of the mind, and the face is actually showing. So that's why uh, uh, Dharma is asking, you are covered with a shadow of grief. Second point. Third, Myalata um, Mukhena. Uh, your face is actually darkened. Right? Face is darkened. Um, then fourth one, uh, Antaradhim. You have some internal disease. Dure Bandham. Or is your friends far away? Right? So Prabhupada talks about this, that how symptoms of Kalyu, one is full of anxieties. Right? Full of anxieties because of three reasons. Right. One is internal diseases. Second one, separation from near and dear. And third is maintaining status quo. And it's true, like in the society, there's so much pressure, even on children, you know, like just the children going to school to actually get this grade, get this uh, instrument, just to be in same status quo with the remaining people. It's actually the, the society peer pressure has become such a big thing these days. You know? so, so these three points Prabhupada says, internal disease, separation from near and dear. And he actually says, now like relatives don't live together. You know? uh, parents are somewhere else, children are somewhere else, or people for working have to travel to different cities. They are not together. So because of this, there is so much. Energy. Okay. And also, there's one interesting, like I was reading recently, like, you know, in Mahabharata, there's this uh, uh, episode of Yaksha and Yudhishthir Maharaj, right, where Yaksha asks questions to Yudhishthir Maharaj. In that, he asks one question, who is a person who's really happy? And Yudhishthir Maharaj says three points. One, he says, person who has no debt. 
And we all have that. And everyone is under mortgage, monthly mortgage payments for this, that, that, that whole list, right? One who has no debt. Second, one who can eat food cooked at home. That maybe we still have the privilege of having home cooked food. Right? Third one, he says, one who does not have to travel to a distant land for earning his livelihood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we all symptoms of health. Text 20. Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. I have lost my three legs and I am now standing on one only. Are you lamenting for my state of existence? Or are you in great anxiety because henceforward the unlawful meat eaters will exploit you? Or are you in a sorry plight because the demigods are now bereft of their share of sacrificial offerings because no sacrifices are being performed at present? Or are you grieving for living beings because of their sufferings due to famine and drought? So again, four points here. So Dharma is asking Dhara that are you lamenting because I, religious principles, like there are four principles of religion. What is it? What are the four principles of religion? Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha hmm. and... Uh, Not those. Uh, the four limbs of uh, religion, right? Uh -huh. okay, that is Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, we say in terms of the uh, Purushartha. But oh, oh. in terms of religion, what are the four legs of Dharma? Oh, Mesh Daya, Satya, Truth. 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 <clears throat> okay, so two you got. So mercy, uh, Satya, truthfulness, okay? Truthfulness and... Cleanliness and austerity. Cleanliness and austerity, right? So these four yes. are there and said in Kalyug, well, there's a little bit of truthfulness less, but everything else is gone. Right? Okay, so he's asking, uh, Eka Padam, are you lamenting because I am standing on only one leg? My three legs are actually broken. And then next she says, uh, are you lamenting because unlawful meat eaters are going to exploit you? That we see all over in Kali, it's like so prominent. For meat eating, they grow all these crops and feed the cows. It's like very unfortunate. Then third one, are demigods bereft of sacrificial offerings? Okay. And then fourth one, are uh, are people faced with famine and uh, rain? There's no rain, right? Drought, right? And are there sufferings? People are lamenting because and because of that, are you actually? Uh, so these four points are said. Prabhupada and purpose says Kalyug means duration of life is reduced, no mercy, power of memory, recollection is gone, and no religious principles. Everything is diminishing. Okay. And Prabhupada also points out gradation of people, like long purpose problem. Okay. So the top is the Vaishnava Brahmanas, then Kshatriya, then Vaishya, then Shudra, then there is Mlesha, then Yavana, and Chandala. So Prabhupada points out this. And he says, now these days, it is only Nesha, Yavana, and Chanda. That is the situation of Kali. Right? these three. And, uh, and also Prabhupada talks about this entire cycle of sacrifice, right? So uh, I'll just quickly share my screen. Everyone knows this from the uh, third chapter of uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita. Sorry, one minute. Right, so Prabhupada points about how, uh, you know, cycle of sacrifice, how uh, we all live on food grains. Food grains comes from rain, rain comes from yagya, yagya comes from prescribed activities. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just put up this chat. So this is very easy to see that entire cycle of sacrifice. Yag Yagnartha. Yeah. yeah. Yagnartha karmano something. Yes, it's, uh, that is, you're talking of 3.9, but after that, 3.10 to 3.7 oh. of Bhagavad Gita, uh, oh. Krishna talks about the cycle of sacrifice. So you can see here, so you can see my screen, right? So, so basically, we all live on food grains. Even those who eat animals, they have to you know, have food grains for the animals, right? And grains come from where? Rains. Rains come from where? Sacrifice. Right, because the demigods are pleased with the sacrifice, they give rain. And then uh, yagya comes from where? Prescribed duties. Right? 
and prescribed duties comes from where the, uh, the Vedas and Vedas come from where right so just from depending on food grains the living entity depending on food grains so if you see from here everything is actually somehow or other connecting to Krishna right so uh, yeah so that is a cycle of sacrifice but you know if you see for devotees See, if you see living entities live on food grains, food grains on this and this, this goes all the way till here. So that is one way of the karma kanda section. But for devotees, when we offer food to Krishna, right, this part, right, we are just doing this one act. Whatever we eat, offer to Krishna, this entire cycle is automatically satisfied. So when you're offering food to Krishna, it's actually we are completing that entire cycle. So so that's Prabhupada talks about this in the purpose. So I okay. So yeah, so that's that. And then okay. Now one more very nice point Prabhupada says in the purpose that yes, there are all these yagyas, but for devotees, we don't have to do this karmakanda sacrifice. Why? Prabhupada says because devotees' lives itself um, is a symbol of sacrifice. The very life of a devotee is a symbol of sacrifice. Everything we do in our life as devotees is yagyarthe karma no anyatra loko yam karma bandhana. Everything we do, we do it. Krishna for your pleasure. Krishna for your pleasure. Krishna for your pleasure. Okay. So Prabhupada says, the very life of a devotee is a symbol of sacrifice. Hence, we don't have to do all the karma karma because we are doing the highest sacrifice of connecting everything to Krishna. Okay, 21. When Prabhupada talks about the only one yagya that we have to do is Sankirtan yagya. 21. Yes, translation, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Are you feeling uh, convictions for the unhappy women and children who are left forlorn by unscrupulous persons? Or are you unhappy because the goddess of learning is being handled by brahmanas addicted to act against the principles of religion? Or are you sorry to see that the brahmanas have taken shelter of administrative families that do not respect brahmanical culture? So again, three points here. One is, are you unhappy because women and children who are always to be protected are now unhappy? Point. Second point, a uh, Devim Brahma Kule Tu Karmani. That you know, the goddess of learning is handled by Brahmanas who are acting against Dharma. And then third point, a Brahmana Raja Kule. Right? So these point number two and three, that basically is that the Brahmanas, right, they are supposed to be the ones who are actually giving the knowledge, establishing Dharma. They themselves are acting against him. It actually said that Brahmanas are never supposed to take uh, money, salary. Right? Actually, in the seventh canto, when the description of the Brahmanas, that says, okay, Brahmana, there are some emergency activities, but even in those emergency activities, should never accept the salary. And now, Brahmanas they accept salary. Even they for knowledge, you have to pay them, right? And then the last one, a Brahmane Rajakule. That means those who are Brahmanas, they actually uh, are under the shelter of those administrators who are against Brahmanical culture. The administrators are all corrupt. So the kings actually tell the Brahmanas, you teach this. This is the kind of education I want you to give. It's entirely opposite. The Brahmanas are supposed to tell the kings, this is the right thing. But now the administrators who are corrupt are telling the Brahmana, if you don't teach so-and-so in your schools, you're not going to get paid. And then now we see a disconnect between uh, education and character. Right? That's basically a symptom of a Kalyu. Like education actually means good character, but now there is no correlation. Someone can get A grades all, but be the worst of all. That complete disconnect between education and, and what is the use of having all this knowledge if you don't have good character? Okay. Next verse, 22. Next verse. The so-called administrators are now bewildered 
by the influence of the this age of Kali, Kali, and thus they have put all state affairs into disorder. Are you now lamenting this disorder? Now the general populace does not follow the rules and regulations for eating, sleeping, drinking, and mating, etc., and they are in inclined to perform such anywhere and everywhere. Are you unhappy because of this? So it says so-called administrators are bewildered by the influence of Kali. So Shastra Bandhan it basically says that those who are supposed to be representatives of the Lord, right? They are under the influence of Kali. And what is the first point that they're doing in the influence of Kali? Killing cows and destroying them from the Kali. Right? So those two points. So that's what's happening. And then second point, uh, here second point is now the general populace is not following the rules and regulations of eating, sleeping, drinking. As human beings, right, we have this special in the human form body. And this special gift means following rules and regulations while we are eating. We have certain food that is recommended for us. We eat plants, we eat grains, we eat fruits, not animals. That is not recommended. So even those who are human beings, they are no longer following the rules of eating, sleeping, making. Are you lamenting because of that? And then Prabhupada in the purport points out that how he makes a very powerful point. He said these children these days, right? They're poor, innocent children. Every day they are daily victims of the influence of Kali. And then Prabhupada says, previously there was one Ajamil who saw like you know, the, the prostitute and he got corrupted. Now all the children, now they are like thousands of Ajamil, Prabhupada says. Because they are sent to school and what is happening? They are just exposed to all these things. Which Ajamil just saw the prostitute and then he fell down from homicidal culture. And in schools, it's all about this. Like there's a, I was hearing a like, uh, devotee making the comparison that previously in the schools, what was the main complaint? You know, that oh, missing classes, or you know, they have this chewing gum, like you know, all those like silly things. Now, what is the main problem in schools? Shooting, uh, then uh, pregnancy, mm -hmm. all those things. That is actually the problems now mm -hmm. in schools. There's no longer like any character left in these school. Right? And then, so Prabhupada says, now the poor, innocent children, students are daily victims to what was Ajamil's situation. Right? And hence, the parents are not happy with the children. Children are not happy with the parents. In all situations of Kali Prabhupada. Okay, 23. Who next? Oh, oh Mother Earth. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari incarnated himself as Lord Shri Krishna just to unhold, sorry, unload your heavy burden. All his activities here are transcendental and they cement the path of liberation. You are now bereft of his presence. You are probably now thinking of those activities and feeling sorry in his absence. So finally, if you see even the conversation between Yudhishthira Maharaj and Arjun, it's very similar because Yudhishthira Maharaj tells Arjun, are you lamenting because of this, because of this, because of this? And they're all symptoms of Kali. And finally, how does the chapter end? He said, are you lamenting because your most dear friend has not left you? Similarly here, Dharma is asking Dhara. All these different reasons. And then finally, uh, Dharma is asking Dhara, are you really lamenting? Because... The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who actually avatarasya, who incarnated to reduce your burden, has now left. Right? So, you are now bereft of his presence, and you are probably thinking about his activities and feeling that separation. And that's the reason why you are not. Right? So, very similar, the mood between Yudhishthira and Arjun, and now. Uh, now, Prabhupada in the purport, uh, Chakravipada also quotes on this, Nirvana Vilambitani. Right? The quotes on this uh, word. So what is this Nirvana Vilambitani? So Prabhupada explains that, uh, that the activities of the Supreme Personality of God, like how Prabhupada explains in the translation, that the activities are transcendental, 
and they cement the path of liberation. Right? What is that verse? Janma karma chame divya mevum Right? By knowing about the activities of the Lord, we are our, our path to liberation is cemented. But further, Chakravati Pad is actually elaborating when he says Nirvan, Nirvana Vilimbitani, it actually says that the activities of the Lord mock the path of liberation. Right? In comparison to the activities, the nectar of the activities of the Lord, the, the happiness of liberation is insignificant. Right? And this is Rupa Goswami also in Nectar of Devotion, he actually points out. He says that if the happiness of liberation is multiplied by one trillion fold, one trillion fold, one multiplied by nine zero, it still cannot compare to an atomic fraction of happiness obtained from the ocean of devotion service. Right? So the, the main point, you understand this point, right? This word nirvana vilambitani is actually mocking nirvana because the activities of Lord Sri Krishna are so nectarian that you know liberation seems insignificant. Is that okay? This point. So 24. Mother, you are the reservoir of all riches. Please inform me of the root cause of your tribulations by which you have been reduced to such a weak state. I think that the powerful influence of time, which conquers the most powerful, might have forcibly taken away all your fortune, which has adored even by the demigods. The last words are you saying that Vasundara. Vasundara is referring to Mother Earth. Mother Earth's name is Vasundara. We use this word. You must have heard it. That means the reservoir of all riches. So he's calling, Oh, Mother, you are the reservoir of all riches. So please inform me. What is the root cause? What is the mool? The root cause of Adi Mulam, the root cause of all your suffering. And he says, I think it is the influence of time. Because time is all powerful. You know, it conquers even the most powerful and might have forcibly taken away all your fortune, which is adored even by the God. So when Lord Krishna was on this earth, the opulence of the earth was envied even by the gods. But now, Dharma is actually making a point that Krishna has left. So that, under the influence of time, maybe no, uh, that opulence which was adored even by the gods, now that is possibly taken away. No, 25, no, is the reply of uh, Dharma. Okay. Who's next, please? Vijay Mataji. Vijay Mataji. The earthly deity in the form of cow thus replied to the personality of religious principles in the form of bull. O Dharma, whatever you have inquired from me shall be known to you. I shall try to reply to all those questions. Once you two were maintained by your four legs and you increased happiness all over the universe by the mercy of the Lord. So basically here, now Mother Earth is starting to reply to the personality of religion in the form of bull. And saying, oh Dharma, whatever you have inquired, I will give you the answer. And one way, like Chakravati Pad is saying, actually, your Dharma, you already know the answer. Right? But still, and since you have asked, I'm going to reveal the answer. And uh, you too were actually, you were on four legs. But now see your situation. You are still, you are standing on one leg. Eka Pada. Right? And uh, when you were on four legs, you increase the happiness. So Prabhupada talks about this. That the real happiness in this universe is when the four religious principles are it prevalent. Right? When the austerity, uh, mercy, truthfulness, and holiness. When these four principles are there, then there will be happiness on earth. Without these aspects of religion, there is no question of happiness. 26 to 30. Mm, Hare Krishna. Uh, in him uh, reside truthfulness, cleanliness, tolerance, of another another's ha unhappiness, uh, the power of uh, uh, the, the power to control anger, um, self satisfaction, straight for forwardness, steadiness of mind, control of sense organs, responsibility, equality, tolerance, 
equanimity, faithfulness, knowledge, absence of sense enjoyment, leadership, uh, chivalry, influence, uh, the power of the power what make everything possible the discharge of proper duty complete complete independence uh, dexterity um, fullness of all, all, all beauty uh, serenity uh, kind heartedness ingenuity uh, gentility uh, magnanimity determination perfection in all knowledge proper execution Position of all objects of enjoyment, joyfulness, immobility, fidelity, fame, worship, pridelessness, being as the personality of Godhead, the eternity, and many other transcendental qualities which are eternally presented, never to be separated from Him, that personality of Godhead, the reservoir of all goodness and a beauty lord sri krishna as now closed his transcendental pastimes on the face of the earth in his absence the age of kali has spread its influence everywhere so i am um, sorry to see this condition of existence Hare krishna so what is mother earth's answer she could have just said the supreme personality of god has not departed and she didn't say that. She listed this whole list of qualities that she said, in him, that personality, who is the abode of, and she lists like 30, 40 different qualities. That personality who is the abode of all these good qualities has now departed. And when Krishna has left, then all these qualities have also left. And hence, I am lamenting. Okay? So that's another such a wonderful point. Going back to the point we said, when Krishna is there, all good qualities are there. When Krishna leaves, all good qualities are there. Right? So these qualities of Krishna, right? so this week your homework is to actually study the qualities of Krishna from Nectar of Devotion. So Nectar of Devotion, uh, chapters 20, 21 and 22. Right? So these two chapters in Nectar of Devotion, you have to read for this coming week. And it, uh, so Rupa Goswami, he describes 64 qualities of Krishna. But he starts off by saying, actually the qualities of Krishna is unlimited. There's actually a verse, a word that says Krishna is referred to as Gunatma. Gunatma. Gunatma referring to the soul of all good qualities. He is the source of all good qualities. All good qualities, you know, quality, let's say, say humility. Humility itself, one may say a quality, but when it's exhibited by someone, then the quality is really shown. So all those God qualities are actually shown by Krishna and hence is known as Gunatma. Right? And, then, um, and then it said, uh, a living entity who develops these qualities, right, which are found in the Supreme Personality of God, then he can actually be qualified to be with Krishna. Like if you want to be with Krishna, you should have those qualities. Otherwise, how will you associate with Krishna? Right? So you have to, but what is our point? By Krishnaik Sharana, by that one point of surrender to Krishna, will be blessed with all the qualities. Now, when you talk of Krishna's qualities, actually Krishna's qualities are unlimited. Actually, it is said that the Lord, listen to this, the Lord manifests a specific spiritual quality for the benefit of every living entity. Can you imagine? The Lord manifests a specific spiritual quality for the benefit of every living entity. So basically for you, I say, more than Prabhu, Krishna is manifesting one quality. For you, uh, Sri Radha Mata, Krishna is manifesting one quality. Krishna is manifesting one spiritual quality for every living entity. So how many qualities Krishna has? Infinite, unlimited qualities. Mm -hmm. But because we cannot, you know, we cannot just say, oh, unlimited and appreciate Krishna in that way, Rupa Goswami has actually said, okay, here are 64 qualities. Let's focus on this and that way meditate upon Krishna. Mm -hmm. So similar here, there are 40 qualities given. And also there's, uh, there's a verse in the Bhagavatam where Brahma himself is saying that, you know, um, maybe sometime, 
scientists may be able to count the number of atoms on this earth or number of shining molecules in the sunshine, but still they will never be able to count the unlimited transcendent qualities of the Supreme Personality of God. Right? And then also it is a Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says that, it is so beautiful. Okay, so Lord, it says that, you know, because Brahma is saying that maybe someone may have called, counted the number of atoms in this universe, but still he will not be able to count the qualities of Krishna. And then, so nicely he says, actually Shankarshan has counted all the uh, atoms in this earth, in this universe. He knows the number of atoms in this entire universe. But even Shankarshan, He's speaking the qualities of Krishna, but they are never ending. It just keeps going. And in reference to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it's a beautiful verse. It says, Sahasra vadane yabe kahe ananta ek dinera lila tabu nahi paya anta. It's saying that if Ananta Dev, with his thousands of hoods, he's trying to describe even one day of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastime, he would find it impossible to describe. One day, and then another verse actually says, even more beautiful. Sahasra vadane kahe apane ananta, tabu ek lila rateno nahi paya anta. It says, although Lord Ananta is always describing your pastime with thousands of months, he cannot reach the end of even one of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes. <laughs> so imagine the glories of the Supreme Personality of God. Unlimited, unlimited qualities of Krishna. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Prabhuji, words. sorry, uh, Prabhuji, which one? Uh, Chaitanya Charita Amrutha? Uh, reference 16, Madhya 16, 289. There are many references. Uh, Antya 18, 13. Uh, then there's one more, Madhya 21, 12. Thank you. So, anyway, so unlimited qualities of Allah Shri Krishna, you know, and uh, particularly the homework. You know, read because Rupa Goswami he talks about quality and then he gives some nice examples for each of the qualities. Like how I'll just give one example that uh, before the war of Kurukshetra, you know, Krishna promised Kunti Devi that yes, five sons will actually live at the end of Kurukshetra. And at the end of Kurukshetra, when the five sons were there, then Queen Kunti said, Your your word is as truthful. That even if someday the sun rays becomes cooling and the moon rays becomes warming, still you will not bitter from your word. Once your word is there, it's going to happen. Like so, one of the qualities. So that way, there are 64 qualities. So please read that. And also here, Prabhupada stresses on just few qualities you can read through. And just focus on one quality. He says knowledge. Right? Knowledge, there are five aspects of knowledge. This is from Jiva Goswami, elaborating on this purpose. This is very nice. So knowledge, there are five aspects of knowledge. One is intelligence. Second is gratefulness. Third is understanding a circumstance, like, you know, circumstantial environment that, you know, something may be true at one point, may not be true in a different situation, circumstances. Fourth is understanding everything perfectly. And fifth, knowledge of the self. These five things are actually said to be qualities of knowledge. Now, the one that is really wonderful to discuss is gratefulness. Right? So you got this? So intelligence, gratefulness, understanding circumstantial environment, knowing everything perfectly, and knowledge of the self. Right? And uh, out of this gratefulness, you know, knowledge means to be always grateful to the person who has given you the knowledge. It's such a wonderful point that you have received knowledge from someone, right? The symptom of knowledge is to be grateful to the person who has received it. Like Dhruva Maharaj in the fourth canto, he actually makes this point. He says, after receiving the knowledge to Krishna, he said, having received this knowledge, how can I ever forget your lotus feet? How can I ever forget your lotus feet? So there was such a nice point of knowledge that wherever, from whom we get knowledge, one aspect of knowledge is to be grateful to the person who is giving us this knowledge. Okay, so let's, uh, there are, I know it's uh, 41 already. Uh, can we complete the chapter if it's okay? It's just five verses and it's easy. So I'll take like maybe seven, eight minutes more. And uh, please read through all the uh, uh, 
qualities maybe here and also in nectar of devotion right and then maybe you can select you know it's very difficult question but just select a, a quality that you really like to meditate upon or select maybe three qualities of those 64 qualities and you have to post it in the chat right so that everyone will Okay, so let's go to uh, 31. Okay, it's okay. I'll just read so that. Uh, so I'm thinking about myself and also, oh, best among the demigods, about you, as well as all the demigods, sages, then denizens of Pitra Loka, devotees of Lord, all men obedient to the system of Varna and Ashrama and the human society. So basically, now Dhara is actually making the point that once Krishna has gone, all these good qualities are gone, right? And all the people, everyone, Myself, you, all the demigods, all the sages, all the pit uh, denizens of Pitralok, devotees, all this entire system of Varna and Ashrama, the entire thing is actually dependent on Krishna. Now, now Krishna has gone, everything is actually messed up. Everything is messed up. And Prabhupada in the purpose talks about this importance of the Varna Ashram system. Like even Varna Ashram is a system which is actually created by Krishna himself. So now the creator has gone, then even the system of Varnashrama is topsy turvy. Uh, and then next verse says uh, Lakshmi Ji, the goddess of fortune. So here, you know, the mood, what is the internal mood of Dhara? She's actually thinking, yes, Krishna has gone, all the one who had all these qualities, he's gone. And because of which, everyone who was satisfied because of that, the sages, the demigods, now everyone is lamenting because Krishna has left. Now, in this, she's actually saying, I was actually so fortunate. Even Lakshmiji was not so fortunate as I was. Why? Because I had the touch of the lotus feet of Lord Shri Krishna in Vrindavan. And even Lakshmiji, like particularly during the Ras Lila, even Lakshmiji, she has the desire, like once from Narad Muni, she heard about Ras Lila and she had the desire to enter Ras Lila. Like even now, if you go to Vrindavan, there's this forest known as Bilvavan. That is a forest, there's a temple there where Lakshmiji is still meditating. So it's on the other side of the Yamuna. And this side of the Yamuna is Raslila. So Lakshmiji is, so if you go to Vrindavan, you have to cross the river to go to Bilvavan. So she's meditating there to actually cross the river and enter the Raslila. But still, she does not have permission to enter the Raslila. But Mother Earth is saying, I am so fortunate that I had the touch of the lotus feet of Krishna you know, while he was performing the past and so many years. So fortunate. Right? Actually, there's this, uh, the 10th canto of Srinam Bhagavatam. And the gopis, like after the Ras Lila, when Krishna disappeared, then they actually go and they are asking all the trees and all the plants and the grass and they're asking, did you see Krishna? Did you see Krishna? And then finally they say like, you know, maybe they have not seen Krishna because they are not answering us. But one person for sure knows where Krishna is. And who is that? Mother Earth. Because for sure Krishna is somewhere on the earth. So let's ask Mother Earth. But then say, Mother Earth has not experienced that kind of separation that we have experienced. So I don't know whether she'll understand our mood and give us an answer. But then they could say the verse, that how fortunate is Mother Earth that she always has the presence of Krishna. Krishna. And actually, one verse from uh, Vrindavan Ashtakam also. The beautiful verse where it says, Kinte, Kinte Kritam Hanta Tapashi Kriti Gopyopi Bhume Stuvate Sma Kirtim Yeneva Krishangi Padanke Tasmi Mamastu Vrindavana Eva Vasa. How fortunate is Mother Earth to actually have the dust of the lotus feet of Krishna, the impressions of Lord Sri Krishna, that uh, the gopis are actually asking, you know. Um, it says here, the gopis glorify the earth saying, Oh earth, what austerities have you performed so that your surface is now marked with Krishna's footprints. Even the gopis are asking Krishna. Okay. So in this verse, basically, uh, Mother Earth is saying, I was endowed with specific powers. Uh, and uh, I'm decorated with the impressions of flag, thunderbolt, elephant, driving rod, and lotus flower. So these are four of the impressions on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. But at the end, 
when I felt I was so fortunate to have Krishna's lotus feet. Now Krishna has feet. That is the reason for my meditation. Okay. And in text 34, she says, I was overburdened with all these military armies, you know, when we you know at the starting of uh, appearance of Lord Sri Krishna, she was overburdened with all these sinful atheistic kings. And Krishna actually came and then he yeah, it eradicated my burden. How fortunate I am that Krishna actually came to take away the burden that I was experiencing. Yeah. Similarly, you were also in distress condition. But Krishna, he actually came. Paritana Sadhana, Vinashaya to Krishna. Dharma Samsta, he actually established you, O Krishna. Right? Um, oh, oh, Dharma, right? He, he established Dharma. Right? So he also inc incarnated by his internal energy in the family of the Yadus to relieve you. So she's thinking of how she's so fortunate to have Krishna appearing just to reduce the burden for her sake, right? And then uh, get the uh, impression of his lotus feet. And now that Krishna has actually left. Right? And then in 35, she says, Who therefore can tolerate that separation from the Supreme Personality of God? Right? And then she compares her fortune with the queens of Dwarka. The queens of Dwarka, they had intimate association with Krishna. But then Krishna used to leave Dwarka and come to Mathura, come to Vrindavan. And then they were feeling separation. But I am so fortunate that Krishna never left me. I always had Krishna's association. I would be immersed in the dust of his lotus feet. Which, and thus would be sumptuously covered with grass which appears like hairs standing on me out of pleasure. It's because of... Uh, the lotus feet of Krishna, that the grass were in ecstasy, like that's compared to the hairs on the of uh, Mother Earth, were in ecstasy and they were standing. And the last verse says, while the earth and the personality of religion were thus engaged in conversation, then Parikshit actually came to this scene. Okay. We'll stop here. Sorry, I went a little fast in the last section, but we can revisit this next time also. Right? We can revisit this last section. But uh, just want to finish the chapter so that you can read through this chapter 16. Also read the qualities of Krishna. Okay. So we'll stop here. It's 40 minutes. So we'll okay. Any uh, quick comments? You know, Vijay Mati said she has some questions. Okay. But uh, any quick comments? Any, uh, we'll quickly share one realization of this chapter. Let me just end it. It's okay. Like, I just want to hear that. You know, I went a little fast, but I hope the, the mood is okay, or mood of Mother Earth, and how she's expressing her great fortune and feeling that lamentation, separation. So. Uh, Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. One point, Prabhuji. Um, the life of a devotee is a symbol of sacrifice. Wonderful. Thank you, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, I like the point that you said that Krishna has one uh, specific spiritual quality for every living being. Amazing. Huh? How merciful he is. Like he loves us so much that just to attract us, he has one specific quality. Sure. It makes us cry that this is our Krishna, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Hare Krishna Prabhuji. We just, I mean, uh, the discuss regarding the, how the earth is very, very fortunate mm -hmm. and uh, comparing like uh, still Lakshmi Ji, Lakshmi Mata is still doing tapa for, to enter in the rasa. That is very interesting and good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much. So we stop here. Okay. The end. Um, if you have questions and if you have time, you can stay or you can post a question from the group. Thank you so much. Grantra Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Vanchata Kutaru Gosu, Kripa Sindhu Guru Gosu, Patitana Pavani. Thank you very much. So this Wednesday or the following Sunday, we'll have the exam. Chapters 13, 14, 15. Sorry, I mentioned 12. It's 13, 14, 15. Saturday. Saturday. Oh. Saturday or Sunday? No, no. Sunday we'll have class, right? Oh, then Saturday. Anyway, we'll yeah. see. There was another program that may have be clashing, but I will update you soon. But uh, Sunday, just uh, prepare. Sunday is Chris Christmas is okay, right? Christmas will have class day. Oh, so next Sunday is okay for everyone to do Christmas. We'll have class. Yeah. Only one thing I wanted to ask everyone 
for we have first of january is a sunday this time so instead of first can we do a class on second because i think a second is holiday for everyone so because first we are planning to have kids in the temple and then 31st we normally go for harinam and rally which goes a late and so you if you have an issue you can let me know but my proposal now is instead of first we do it on monday which is a holiday so sure. if you have any concerns please uh, let me find out okay thank you so much for the invitation so uh, vijay mate if you want to ask questions you can stay or if you have time otherwise we can discuss later so um, so prabhu ji the as you said that uh, uh, earlier days the brahmanas uh, never used to take salaries huh? mm -hmm. so there is there is a question number 1 in the closed book essay questions that explain the benefits of advisors of the state not receiving salary mm -hmm. discuss the relevance of this principle for escon and then it is asking give reference to one verse of the bhakti shastras in your response So, Prabhu Ji, what that verse could be? I was. You could actually talk of eighteen forty-two, where it talks of qualities of a brahmana, right? And then satyam, socham, arjum, uh, shantir arjum, evacha, gyana, vigyana, astikam, brahma karma, swabhavacha. And that's the nature of a brahmana to actually give advice, right? And uh, you can, you know, the main point that why they are not given salary because as soon as it is salary based. Then you know immediately there is that purity is lost, and then when the qualities are described, it says satyam socham arjam. That is satyam that you know the truth may be uh, contaminated based on the salary. So quality. Yeah, yeah, Prabhuji, I was I, I was just um, thinking of which verse we can give. I understand, but uh, Prabhuji, even in even then in in not in those days, even I that this example was Bali Maharaj was coming to my mind how. Bali Maharaj Guru told him not to give, right? Mm. Yeah. So even those days, the um, yeah, not to give charity to women. Yeah. Mm. So yes. you know, yeah. The point is, yeah. So you have a question with that? Or? No, no, Prabhu Ji. I was just, uh, I was just saying that. Uh, the, um, I was just thinking of a bhakti shastri verse. That was my question. Which but which bhakti shastri verse it could be? Ah, uh, Prabhuji, I have another question about this text five, and um, it's still not clear to me that why um, uh, Maharaj Parikshit did not kill ah uh, the Shudra. Ah, uh, but my question is not related to that. My question is ah uh, why the um, Shonika Rishis and others. They are saying that oh why not kill him because isn't it we read that um, in uh, seventh ch fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita that a pandita is samadarshina pandita even considered a dog eater um, to be the same and uttam adhikari doesn't make any distinctions they know that even in the heart of that shudra uh, Krishna is residing right so I understand Maharaj Prakshit is a shatriya he should punish punish Kali but why the rishis want that shudra to be killed? Aren't they should be some darshana? No, see the point about equal vision to everyone does not encourage the point that okay, if there is some kind of uh, you know opposition or some kind of wrongdoing, you know the shatriyas is they cannot just say oh this person is doing wrong and I have to be equal there isn't like this. That equal vision is actually does not. Uh, Allow one to just like make that as an excuse to not do his duty, right? So from the spiritual perspective, yes, we can have a uh, equal vision, but as a duty as a shatriya, so you know you still have to do your duty. Like a if a cop says, "Oh yeah, everyone is equal," then how how will they actually function? You know. So that is one point which is more from the spiritual vision, and that is one perspective which is more in terms of your duties. You know, again that. One can say in terms of nitya dharma and nitya. So, like, not encourage the bad thing, uh, right? The quality. Not encourage the bad thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so, Prabhu, 